told the chat room that we're beginning. The computer says we're live. Hangout is live on air. Woo, that window opened more than I wanted it to. <gasps> There's so much fun to be had. So much fun to be had. And it looks as though my cue from Identity 4 in the chat room is <coughs> We are ready to start the show. Everybody, please, if you hear the echo, disregard it. We can't fix it. I don't know what's going on, but it's showtime anyway. So we're starting in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 671, recorded on Wednesday, May 16th, 2018. Penguin Science Report. I'm Dr. Kiki, and tonight on This Week in Science, we are going to fill your heads with brains, sex, and penguins. But first... Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. There are many things we humans take for granted. And often we do this without much thought or introspection. Like, when's the last time you raveled anything? We plot, we plan, we schedule. Never do we ravel. Raveling of things must take place all the time, otherwise nothing could ever unravel. We assume that we exist, reasonably enough, because if we did not exist, it would be difficult to consider how we might be able to pose the question of our own existence to begin with. And while we wander through life, leaving unasked questions everywhere, there is one question that is that can lead us to the end of our assumptions. Why? Why this and not that? Why here and not there? Why did it happen and why did it not? Why is such a simple looking word and yet without it, it would be difficult to consider how we could have This Week in Science coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know what's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. What's happening, what's happening, what's happening this week in science. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are back yet again to fill your heads with all the science that we enjoy bringing to the world of the interwebs. Well, I guess we got it from the interwebs and then we brought it back to the interwebs once we processed it in our brains and giving it back to you tonight. But we have a wonderful show ahead for you. So much science out there yet again. It's a hard time picking some of those stories, but this week I have stories about mini brains and protons under pressure, and we have an interview to discuss the state of penguins. Justin, what do you have for us this evening? I, I didn't know penguins had their own state. I'm wondering how they vote. What's the problem? <laughs> I've got the brain of an Aleti, proof positive for genetic memory, and a history lesson in an ice core. All right, and moving from there to the animal corner, Blair, what do you have for us this evening? I have temperature-dependent sex determination. I have birds of prey and job creation. And I have the very interesting question, whose bed is cleaner, yours or a chimp's? <laughs> hmm. I mean, I like to think I clean my sheets often enough but well, stay tuned <sighs> conversation for later in the show it's faux gonna the show chimp. it's gonna be the chimp <laughs> <laughs> it just is oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Start all right everyone as we jump into the show i would love to remind you that if you have not yet subscribed to the twist podcast you can do so all places that good podcasts are found itunes the google podcast portal portal stitcher spreaker tune in etc. You can find us on YouTube and Facebook, and you can also just visit This Week in Science, twist.org. Search for This Week in Science on the web. You'll find us. But now, I'd love to introduce our guest for the evening. We are interviewing today Ron Naveen. He's the founder and president of Oceanides, 
a U.S.-based nonprofit science and educational organization that got its start in 1987. He also began the Antarctic Site Inventory Project in 1994. It's the only non-governmental, publicly supported scientific research project working in Antarctica and the only project monitoring penguin population changes across the entirety of the Antarctic Peninsula. He also it can be called a professional penguin counter. Ron, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks, Kiki. It's great to be here. It's wonderful to have you on the show this evening. I would love to know how you got your start in working with penguins. What was it that first took you to Antarctica and got you involved in the, the lives of penguins? Uh, the short story, I think, is that when I was about 13 or 14, I got interested in bird watching through a friend. And I grew up in northeastern Pennsylvania, and those pileated woodpeckers, scarlet tanagers, yellow warblers really turned me on. And of course, I had to listen to what mom and dad said, go to college, go to grad school, et cetera, et cetera. But I always kept coming back to birds. I had a long career as a practicing attorney, actually. Uh, ended up with the U.S. government, uh, at EPA, doing noise pollution and air pollution work. Mm -hmm. And the creme de la creme job was with the National Marine Fisheries Service doing marine mammal protection work and Endangered Species Act work, all of which required me when going to court to understand what I really never had learned before about statistics and population dynamics and ecology. So I've always just kept coming back to birds. So I finally left my job with the government, started whale watching and seabird watching trips because I wanted to see those birds offshore, the gannets and the boobies and the auks and the alcids. And I had a really good friend working uh, on my whale watching trips who had been an inspector on Japanese whale watching trips in the Antarctic. Japanese whale hunting trips, I mean to say. Uh, Tom McIntyre, a great friend, got me interested not only in the Antarctic, but in seabirds, and eventually starting to work in the Antarctic tour industry. And I mean, you see, you start dreaming about penguins. I have written about the fact that when you really get hooked, like I'm really hooked, uh, you dream about them, you think about them, you see them in your sleep. I don't count sheep, I count penguins. <laughs> uh, but penguins are us, and in fact, the main theme of Oceanides is simply by just believing that we are penguins and understanding the vitals that they need to survive. We can learn something about our own lives on the planet and what we might have to cope with, just like some of my Antarctic Peninsula penguins are coping with right now. So, so this was... This leads to an interesting question because there's nothing that I could think of more confounding than having a huge number of penguins and being responsible for counting them because they kind of move around a little bit and they, they I can't maybe at this point in your uh, penguin counting career, you've, you've gotten to the point where you can tell them apart, but, and I'm sad to say this, I, I don't hope I don't offend any penguins. I cannot tell penguins apart. Oh, no. No, um, so no how that's true. You know that you haven't already counted a penguin that you, you've counted? Like, what is what is a typical day of penguin counting look like? I think I should start by saying there are, uh, are times to count penguins, November to February in the Antarctic, and November, December, what we're counting our nests which happy to tell you, Justin, don't move. It's really good. <laughs> so you move from right to left or left to right, you get three counts within 5%, you tote it up in your notebook and you move on. The real challenge comes in January and February when we're back to count the chicks at four weeks of age, hopefully at the peak of what's called chick crashing, when they leave their nests and gather in big teenage gangs that's a little more difficult. You have to run around and do a little corralling them, 
we do have permits from the U.S. government to allow us to do a little bit of that work. So it's much harder and we expend more calories in January and February chasing the penguin chicks. They're not always running around, though. The nests don't move, which is great. <laughs> so, so I imagine you mentioned uh, bird watching. I think about um, the bird counts that they do with birds of prey during migration. They kind of pick and estimate kind of quadrants. Is that how you work when they're moving around and they're older? Uh, it's gotten very sophisticated. Uh, most of our counts are done uh, off of expedition tour ships. So through the good graces of companies, in particular One Ocean Expeditions of Canada, we get to ride on 12 or more of their trips every year. And we usually work in two, uh, teams of two, go ashore and start counting while the uh, guests, the passengers, the tourists are having a good time ashore. <laughs> Those, those colonies are relatively easy to count within two or three hours. We can knock off a 500, 600 nest colony pretty easily. What's gotten to be really exciting about our work is what do we do about the much larger colonies where you have thousands of nests? So by using photography, we've flown from helicopters, taken photographs from helicopters, and now, most excitingly, through uh, the good graces of my colleague Heather Lynch up at Stony Brook, we're doing analyses of satellite photos. So amazingly, we can peer down from space, look at penguin colonies and count nests. So it's getting very, very sophisticated. We're now flying also small drones in certain instances. So photography, either from drones or from space, it's great. It does cause a lot of school kids that I talk to to ask me, hey, Ron, when are you going for astronaut training, thinking that I'm going to go flying around in space counting <laughs> penguins, but I think I'm a little too old for that. Oh. And, it, and there isn't, uh, maybe I've got this wrong, but isn't uh, Antarctica has very little cloud cover uh, during the year? Uh, au contraire, oh. it's got a heck of a lot of cloud cover. So uh, my colleagues who do the satellite analyses, uh, they get a lot of pictures of clouds. And then, of course, the whole thing is programmed through computers. So uh, orders are given you know, to get the photographs of this site or that site. And the satellite keeps on spinning around and eventually we'll get a picture. And, and uh, the the weather is pretty crappy in Antarctica. And the, but the penguins are are do, do they? I and mean, again, this is something I don't know. They they go back to the same spots to nest. Um, the emperor penguins, which breed on ice, don't have any rocks to go back to. But the three primary species that I count: the Adelie penguins, chinstraps, and Gentoo penguins all go back to the same nesting site they bred at the previous season. The Gentoo pair may stay together in the winter, but the other two species, the Adelis and Chinstraps, go in different directions, the mates. The male typically will come back in late October, early November, and start <laughs> making a noise, advertising over his stones, trying to make sure that uh, the female knows that he's there and ready to go, and hopefully she'll get back uh, within 10 or 12 days of his arrival. They'll mate again, and off we go for another mating season. And so in your, uh, you've done a report, which is the State of the Penguins report, and you started doing that recently. What was the goal of creating a report like this? Uh, the State of Antarctic Penguins Report just came out with its second iteration on World Penguin Day, April 25th. The goal of our uh, effort here is to try to make sure people are talking accurately about how many penguins there are. Uh, it's been very difficult. It's not just our team that's collecting data. It's over 600 researchers around the world who are trying to figure out how many penguins they have in their own bailiwick or their own backyard. We're trying to compile all the Antarctic data together to make sure 
that when discussions take place, say, in the Antarctic Treaty system, system about how to manage tourism or fishing, that everybody's using the same set of baseline data. In certain instances, we'll be able to tell from location to location if there have been changes. But the idea is that for actually for the first time in 25 years to do this kind of compilation. Our second edition just came out about a month ago and we'll continue doing this into the future. It's hopefully gonna be a great resource for the 53 governments who manage Antarctica which is 10% of the planet and not owned by anybody. So we want to make sure that uh, accurate facts are being used, uh, not misinformation when discussing trends. In my part of the Antarctic, which has had a significant warming trend over the last 60 years, two of the species of delis and chin straps have declined. Gen 2 penguins, however, are booming. So there we want to dig even deeper to find out why those disparate responses. On the other side of the Antarctic, for example, the eastern side, Adelie penguin populations are maintaining their size or maybe even increasing a little bit. Climate change is local. So hopefully through our data, all that we are collecting around the continent we'll be able to sort out regional differences and help the managers and conservers of Antarctica, these 53 countries to do a good job. That's amazing. So I was watching a, a, a video that NBC Nightly News did on your, on, on your efforts. And in one particular part of the video, there's a, a clip where you're sitting in one of your study sites and yeah. talking about the fact that there's no snow. So over the time that you've been going to Antarctica over the last 30 years and observing these areas, observing the penguins, what are the big changes that you have seen? Well, uh, it's pretty dramatic. I guess it's testament, of course, to how old I am but and how long I've been going there. But there are a couple of beaches I can now walk that were covered by glaciers when I first started 30 some years ago. The location you're talking about from the NBC piece is called Brown Bluff. Uh, when we did our filming there a couple of years ago in January, there was no snow. It's just crazy. So we're seeing certain winters now where there's an absence of snow, maybe even more rainfall than before. The weather is changing. Actually, the weather change, the climate change in the Western Antarctic Peninsula is quite dramatic. Over the last 60 years, the warming trend has been three degrees uh, centigrade or five Fahrenheit on a year-round basis. And in the winter, a whopping five degrees Fahrenheit, five degrees centigrade and nine degrees Fahrenheit. I mean, that's enormous. Uh, these penguins now are going through changes that we humans might have to go through in our home regions at some point in the future. So it gives me great pause. Penguins, I believe, are us. I keep saying that. Uh, like other humans, like, like humans, like butterflies, like other animals, penguins need food to eat. They need to have a good home. They need to have good health. And they have to produce babies and grandchildren. And mm -hmm. it's in those very general basic ways we start thinking about if the Adelis and chin straps are having a hard time now in the peninsula, what's going on? One factor we're examining, although we don't have any conclusions yet, it could be a food issue. We're concerned that the krill population, the very small crustacean that they eat, that those numbers are down or the krill stock has moved. All these penguins can eat fish as well as krill. The gentoos have very nicely switched over to fish a lot more readily than the other two and seem to be booming at the moment. They're moving their breeding grounds to the south. So there's a lot more to sort out here. Climate change is an important factor around the continent. It's an amazing place. It's <clears throat> the size of the US and Mexico. It's 5.4 uh, million square miles, 99.4% covered by ice. 
that's 90% of the world's ice and 70% of the world's fresh water, my goodness, if that all melts, it's going to have great consequences for low-lying areas across the planet. It's going to have huge impacts. Yeah. Um, the, the penguins themselves, though, living there, I mean, it's kind of, it's, it is this, like, okay, what's happening there? We're seeing the glaciers go away. There's more uh, bare ground that the penguins have to deal with. Do some species do better where, with <coughs> breeding in bare ground areas where maybe there's more rocks for cover as opposed to the snow, the snow cover? Or do you think there, there are any trends to how the various species are dealing with the, uh, the, the Adelis, Chinstraps, and Gentoos generally like to have rocks on which to nest, and they can build stone nests that are pretty dramatically <laughs> substantially full of lots and lots of stones. Yeah. So it's not necessarily that there's, you know, they're adapted to having more stones, and that's great. It's a question of whether they're, you know, it's cold snow and not melted, and they're not nesting, and uh, on stones that are covered by slush and ice and mud. So we're seeing a lot more of the, these muddy, slushy conditions during the nesting season. It's not too uncommon later to see the chicks in the breeding territories, you know, inundated with mud and guano. But to have that happen in November and December when it should be all snow and really cold, things are changing. It's pretty stark. It is, but... It, it, I mean, it, one of the species that I would think would have a silver lining in, in global warming, right, might be penguins. Uh, penguins, penguins, if I'm not mistaken, have been on this planet much, much more, much, much longer than human or even maybe hominid history, right? This is, this is, a, this is sort of one of our ancient species, although at some point they were much taller. Um, yeah, the, what were they like? The six foot tall peng giant yeah, penguins in Australia? Australia. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's that's absolutely correct. I mean, the penguins have been around for at least 37 million years, perhaps even 50 or more. We humans, hey, I mean, we're just like a yeah, little <laughs> speck on the back of an ant or something like that. So, so penguins historically have seen a thing or two and yes. have been good survivors. So, so really, and I think to your point, what we really should be focusing on is how do they do it? Because we might need some advice pretty soon. Well, uh, evolution, as you all know, is not something that happens overnight. Uh, Kiki was referring to the six-foot penguin. There was a big six-foot penguin that once lived in Antarctica at a time when there were trees, uh, maybe even palm trees in Antarctica before the great supercontinent of Gondwana broke up. That penguin was six foot tall and weighed about the, oh, as much as the Chicago Bears linebacker. So <laughs> you wouldn't want to meet up with one of those guys. And I also laugh, uh, people don't quite understand that when that great supercontinent split up, penguins, the flightless, birds stayed south, and all their congeners to the north, the alcids, the guillemots, the puffins, they, they're the ones with wings. So the question I get is what's going to happen if polar bears start invading the Antarctic? <laughs> no! Well, the, no, I, there's some question as, whether, as to whether uh, the polar bears would survive, but if they did, my guess is that evolutionarily speaking, penguins might learn how to fly again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh my God. They're birds. There's no nothing keeping them from being able to do that again. <laughs> That's absolutely it's correct. Time. It's time. I mean, it's the, I was just going to say they don't fly, but the wings are full of muscles. They have more feathers, these penguins, than any other bird species. They're really built for living in this crazy environment. Uh, and I agree with you, Justin. I think they'll make it somehow, some way. We may be a glimmer in history, but uh, penguins will still be around. 
I, I personally worry about the fact that there's this climate change impact from loss of habitat or, um, or changing temperatures. There's also the impact of moving ocean currents. And on top of that, uh, unsustainable fishing practices. And for penguins that eat fish, which is what I'm most familiar with, um, that's, that's a really big impact potentially on their, on their livelihood. So I think that I'm, I'm kind of curious if you think they'll be able to make it through this kind of minefield of obstacles that we're slowly creating for them. Um, well, we don't know. And we don't know whether we humans are going to survive the minefield either. Fair point. Uh, it's, <laughs> I mean, I just don't know. I'd like to uh, maintain a shred of optimism mm -hmm. uh, in that it's going to take years, if not decades, to change our practices, the kind of uh, energy we use, for example. Are we going to really switch to wind and solar? But getting to know penguins and worrying about what they're going through really makes you think about all those issues you just mentioned. It's just been a little more than a year that a huge chunk of the Larsen Sea ice shelf cracked off in the Weddell Sea, the so mm -hmm. an iceberg the size of the state of Connecticut, for goodness yep. sake. Um, the change in the ocean currents we've learned from uh, new studies out over the last two months are undermining glaciers in the Antarctic. The Thwaites mm -hmm. Glacier and the Pine Island Glacier on the western side, the Totten Glacier to the east. Um, the more and more fresh water that gets into the Antarctic ecosystem is going to upset the nutritional balance which may have some link to how much krill there is and whether the krill population is down or up or moving somewhere else. But what really strikes me about doing this work and probably strikes all of us who do science is the more and more I do this, the less and less I think I know. I feel just so bewildered by how complicated and crazy it is. And I would hope that the work that we do and by using penguins as a symbol for climate change, we can inspire people to think about themselves, think about our changing planet and darn it, do everything we can every waking minute to try to make sure that we humans are treading lightly on this earth. Yeah. And I do know that Antarctic tourism is starting to grow significantly and having its own impact. But at the same time, it's probably the all the cruises that are going down there, as you mentioned, it's benefiting your ability to do that work. And you started out as a citizen science, you know, coming to it right. from that area of interest. And I think, you know, the, the citizen science science world is growing and there are more and more people who want to get involved in work like what you're doing? And is there any, um, are there opportunities for people to get involved with Oceanides? Or uh, can you give any advice to people who are interested in doing this kind of work in Antarctica? Anyone who's interested in these topics, please get a hold of me, get in touch with us through our website. We'd like to keep connected. I mean, as we continue to do work using photographs from, well, could be helicopters, drones, or satellites, uh, we're at some point gonna be needing help online to do some of that counting work. I have a colleague I work with named Tom Hart who runs an organization called Penguin Lifelines in the UK. And you can actually sign up with Tom and do a little bit of penguin counting from photographs right now. Hopefully that work is going to expand and hopefully in the future, we can get more and more people to actually visit there. I would like to mention uh, fishing's come up and tourism has come up, both of which human activities are, in my opinion, pretty well regulated. Uh, we have to keep a close eye on whether the krill population is changing, and we have to keep a close eye on the practices being followed by the tourist industry. Right now, the tour industry is following guidelines for more than 40 or 50 sites, making sure that people keep a safe distance away from the penguins. Uh, a number of the tour, a number of the fishing companies within the last two years have voluntarily attempted and hopefully are succeeding in staying away from penguin breeding grounds during the breeding season, keep the fishing activity away from where the penguins are hunting for krill. So, I mean, again, the, 
the sand are part of the reason for being in the Antarctic and getting involved with penguins is the Antarctic Treaty itself. Now I'm I'm old enough to remember quite a few of the lyrics of the of the Beatles and John Lennon songs. And if you recall John Lennon's song, Imagine a Brotherhood and Sisterhood of Humankind Working Together. That's what the Antarctic Treaty is. Nobody owns that 10% of Earth where 53 countries work together. It's the first nuclear test ban agreement. It's a continent devoted to science, peace, and conservation. And penguins are leading the way, helping us think good thoughts about how to conserve our very fragile planet. Oh my goodness, you just gave me goosebumps. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> what a wonderful message. It is, a, that's, it's, it's amazing because you think about all, all of the problems we have here on the planet and that we are able to cooperate at least someplace. <laughs> I agree. Penguins are us. Let's not forget it. <laughs> Let's not forget it. All right. So to get in touch with you, where can uh, where can people find you so that we can uh, we can send them your direction for more information? Go to the web www.oceanides.org. Uh, you can get a copy of our or download a copy of our latest penguin report. But there's a huge amount of information there about Antarctica, about climate change, about penguins about our Antarctic site inventory. I really appreciate uh, everybody out there who's tuning in. Take a look uh, and stay in touch. I love to keep in touch uh, with you and uh, very fond of doing classroom sessions with kids by Skype or Google Hangouts or whatever. So the more and more people we can get talking up penguins, like what happened to me and birds when I was a young kid, uh, it's going to change the planet forever. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to get a movement together that's going to make a difference here. Absolutely. Oh, I'm going to talk to my son's teacher. They just finished a unit on penguin, penguins in the first grade. I'm going to have to <laughs> get them to bring a computer into the classroom and bring you in. And I know that we do have many teachers in our audience, so I do Great. hope that they, that they contact you. And I have... I have teen volunteers every summer who help us raise baby penguins and talk to the public all about right. our imaginative penguins every day. So I Excellent. think I'll be following up with you as well. That'll be great. We yeah, just yeah. did a wonderful event on World Penguin Day at the Library of Congress and we had Lily the Magellanic Penguin came to visit us from the Maryland <gasps> Zoo. and. Yeah. So you can also find that online, a little bit of Twittering and Googling. You can find Ron and Lily doing their thing on World Penguin Day. Fantastic. I love it. Ron, thank you so much for your time. We thank really Thank you, guys. Appreciate. Yeah, it's wonderful it that we going. were able to get to talk to you. Yeah, you too. Keep in touch. Take care Thanks, now. Ronnie. Thank you. You too. Thanks, Have a Ron. wonderful night. Okay, Thanks. bye, Justin. See you later. Bye. <laughs> bye. All right, everybody, this is This Week in Science. We are going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with more science after these messages. Stay tuned. I'm going to bed. <laughs> a good one. <laughs> Thanks, you guys. Really appreciate it. Thank you. First assumptions were correct, let's prove the rest, it's hot. The methods of hypothesis and patience are the only things I need. Hey everybody, 
Thank you for listening. Thank you for joining us on the web this evening. If you are joining us live, we appreciate you being here with us. I just have a few messages for you about how you can help twist and keep it going since we are a listener supported show. So if you are interested in giving your support aside from listening, I mean, the fact that you're listening every week, giving us your time and your attention, thank you so much. But if you'd like to support a little bit further what we do, here are the ways that you can do that. First, the easiest thing to do is head to twist.org because that is where you find all of the wonderful things related to twist. If you have not yet subscribed or if you know somebody you think should subscribe, tell them to go to twist, T-W-I-S dot org and click on the big orange subscribe button. That will give them links to subscribe directly to our channel on YouTube, to our podcast feed on iTunes, or the Google Play podcast portal. Additionally, if you have sub subscribed and you're listening every single week because it's downloading to your personal device and you're like, oh, it's Twist again. Here I am listening in the car. And you're like, man, I wish I had a t-shirt or something. Well, you can get that too. Head over to our Zazzle store. You click the Zazzle store link and that will take you to zazzle.com slash this week in science where you can find all of the twist related products that you might enjoy. We have so many fun things like mugs and t-shirts that have and mouse pads that have the twist logo on them. Other products are covered in Blair's wonderful animal art from the Animal Corner calendars that she's been doing the last few years. We've got some really neat products there. Also, there's some other products that um, are meant, they have the twist logo, but are meant to be more subtle so that maybe our twist twist polo shirt you can wear to teach your class in, or you can wear it to work even, twist polo shirt. Proceeds of sales of all these items do support twists. The money goes into our account and it goes toward paying our bills. Other ways that you can help us sub support Twist, click on the big yellow donate button that is on the sidebar of our page. That will take you to a PayPal uh, donation uh, page where you can donate an amount of your choosing. Similarly, you can scroll down to the bottom of any show episode page and click on one of the buttons at the bottom to be able to create a recurring payment. So say you don't want to just do a one-time contribution, but you want to give like $2 a month. You know, what is that? If we do four episodes, like 50 cents an episode, that seems reasonable, right? But it really helps us out. And that's through PayPal that that money will go. And so fees do apply. The other way you can help is to click on the Patreon link at the top of our Twist webpage. That will take you to Patreon, patreon.com slash This Week in Science, where again, click on the big button, become a patron, and help support the production of Twist and all the things that we do to keep this show going week after week, month after month, bringing you great interviews like the ones we, like the one we just had with Ron Naveen from Oceanides or from, with Karen Bondar, uh, the, the biologist with a twist who has written Wild Moms last week. Um, there are wonderful interviews that we bring and, you know, we do it every single week. And when you help out choosing the amount that you think you can afford every month, it really makes a difference. And we don't have to get advertising. That's what I want to keep doing. I would like to remain listener supported because you are the people who matter. You're the ones who keep this show going week after week after week. You keep coming back for it and we keep coming back to bring it to you. So everyone out there, the other way, if you're unable, like I said, you know, to support us, another way that you can do that, just tell people to go to twist.org and get them to subscribe. Get them to click that big orange subscribe button on the web page and bring more people to the Twist family. That would be amazing. <laughs> it would. But what's amazing is you being here in the first place. Thank you for all of your support. Thank you for watching Twist. Thank you for listening to Twist. We really could not do this without you. <laughs> Explain things you've heard more than intuition. A lot of reason shows the way to go.
And we're back with more this week in science. Oh yeah, we are back, and now is the time for that fun segment of the show where we find out this weekend what has science done for me lately. lately. Oh yeah, oh the dulcet tones. <laughs> <laughs> this week's letter comes from Rachel Pepling. She writes in, she actually tweeted, she sent me a direct message on Twitter with this one. She said, hi, Dr. Kiki. We met very briefly ages ago when you were a judge for the Chem Champs competition at the ACS meeting in San Francisco. I only recently started listening to Twist, though science has done a lot for me for a long time, starting with a fascinating undergrad life in wildlife ecology. I kind of want I kind of want to be Blair when I grow up <laughs> to, to recently benefiting from new treatments for a rare autoimmune disease. I wanted to share what twist has done for me lately. I had an episode playing in the car when I picked up my eight year old son for his gymnastics class. I was about to switch to the radio when he told me to stop. He wanted to keep listening. Yes. He was highly intrigued by the slave ants story. Oh. Twist has now become our thing when it's just the two of us trekking between activities. So thank you and Blair and Justin for giving me an easy way to fill at least one of my kids' heads with science. Awesome. So good. So good. Filling the kids' heads with science. We do love that as well. <laughs> science, the gift that keeps on giving. Seriously, slave ants. <laughs> that leads to a general love of biology and science. And who knows? You know, just an interested, curious life uh, can be very, very beneficial. Everyone, remember out there, we need you to write in like Rachel did. Rachel, thank you so much for sharing this story and say hi to your son for us. Tell him we know he's listening <laughs> and we want to know what other, what other stories he likes. Um, you out there, all of you who have not written in with your what has science done for you lately stories. Bad, bad listener. No, I'm kidding. No, <laughs> no. no listener shaming. <laughs> yeah, we're not going to shame you on that count, but it's your time. It's your time to write in. Tell us your story. What has science done for you lately? You can leave us a message on our Facebook page. It's facebook.com slash this week in science or like some people. If we're on Twitter, you can message me on Twitter. But uh, an under, another easy way to do that is just email me, Kirsten, K-I-R-S-T-E-N, at thisweekinscience.com. We want to hear from you and fill this segment of the show with letters from you. Going as long as we can. Thank you. Are we ready for some science? Bring it. Sure ready. Time to bring it. So uh, you may or may not have heard this story um, this week, but it it got me excited. Old data, like we talk about, uh, we we talk about finding those fossils in a drawer. You know, that's the the finding of the, the university basement, the museum the attic. Yeah, exactly, and so. It's been about 15 years since NASA sent the Galileo spacecraft to uh, fly to Jupiter and to dip into its outer atmosphere. And all that data, at a certain point, it just kind of, you know, they stopped analyzing it. They've done it. They've moved on to new missions. There's nobody really looking at that data anymore. Um, and some researchers, though, started thinking about the Hubble spacecraft findings of when they looked at Jupiter and looked at the moon Europa, that they saw what appear to be jets. I think it's water, liquid water coming from inside Europa. And nowadays, oh, water, kind of, water jets. Okay, that's water different. jets. I, 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 I just assumed out. meant flying around. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. We found aliens this week. Did you know? Not, not just <laughs> flying around. The water jets coming out from the surface of Europa. And there's this we images of Europa show it to be this very icy surface it's covered in ice. It's a ball of ice. And, you know, we thought, oh, maybe it's all frozen. But there are these deep cracks and fissures in the surface of this moon. And, you know, it's like, okay, great. Jovi the Jovian 
uh, gravitational system was really wreaking havoc on the surface of this planet. But what is all that ice moving around on top of if it's moving enough to crack and break and make these fissures? And Hubble was looking, the Hubble Space Telescope took a look and has observed what looked to be geysers, jets of water shooting from some of these cracks in the surface. But the question is, is it really water? And we keep, you know, we've talked about it many times on the show since the discovery. And we're like, yes, it's water. There's water, liquid water, oceans, salt water, oceans underneath the surface of this ice. And we don't really know that. <laughs> we just, it's like, what else would be liquid there? And so the only way to find out is to fly something through there, to be able to look at the molecular spectra, to be able to really get a taste of it. And uh, some researchers went, huh. Didn't we do that once? Didn't we do that? We kind of did that. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, so these researchers who uh, came up with this idea, they went back and they looked at the data from Galileo and they found that one of the flybys came uh, within a few hundred kilometers of the moon's surface and it flew near this particular crater region that is spewing uh, geysers. And so during when it, during this pass, it actually, uh, there was a magneto magnetometer studying the magnetic fields of Jupiter and the moons of Jupiter as it was going around them. And it measured some really significant changes in the magnetic field in that area, this Pwill crater region, as it's called. And so they think that these fluctuations are not just due to uh, the magnetic field of the whole system, but to perturbations from a, a water plume, a water jet, a geyser that is uh, in the air, in the region around the moon. And the authors write in their paper in Nature Astronomy, the sudden short duration, duration jump and the frequency of intense emissions can be interpreted as consistent with a highly localized source of plasma, thereby, thereby supporting the hypothesis that the magnetic perturbations arise from passage through a localized plume. And, but when it happened, Hubble had yet to see the geysers, and so nobody noticed the, the change in the data, really, because nobody was looking for it. And so it went completely unrecognized and has just been in storage until uh, these researchers decided to go back and take a look. Nice. So, Justin, pack yes. your bags. We're moving to Europa. <laughs> <laughs> the oceans, the saltwater oceans of Europa. Yeah. You know, it's still Scenic Europa. Absolute. This is, you know, this is not absolute proof that it's water, but it is, uh, it is, proof it is it is another data point that suggests uh that we need to go back we need to go back mm -hmm. and look at europa and send a mission there and i luckily i do believe nasa is really considering it at the moment and in fact um there according to the ars technica article that i'm looking at there's a clipper mission the europa clipper flyby mission could launch as early as 2022 that's four years away so you want to know if there's water on Europa? Let's get NASA to send that mission. Let's do it. Yes. Uh, moving on up, though. Hey, so protons, neutrons, electrons, you know, these. Voltrons. Go, <laughs> no, Justin. These components of atoms, the things that make up matter. Everything, the building right? blocks of everything. Of everything. Well, researchers decided to take a close look at the proton because they, they were thinking, they're like, huh, we've never really dug into how much pressure is at the center of a proton. And so if you think about it, so we've got planets where there's a lot of material and the core, there's a huge amount of pressure, right? You know, if you go bigger than planets, you've got gas giants. You go even bigger, you've got stars. The densest stars, the neutron stars, massive amounts of pressure at their core because of the force of all the material pushing in on the center and also the force of the center pushing out to avoid being collapsed, right? So there's just a massive amount of pressure going on. And protons are made up of 
quarks and gluons and these other subatomic particles, sub subatomic particles mm -hmm. that kind of fit together in the same kind of way. They all fit together and they, there's pressure pushing down toward a center and out toward the outside. And researchers used a really cool uh, big device. It's a particle accelerator, particle detector, known as the Continuous Electron Beam Accelerator Facility Large Acceptance Spe Spectrometer. This is, uh -huh. <laughs> otherwise known as CLASS. Class. I was going to say, there's an acronym in there. There's, this acronym has class. Uh, it's located at the Jefferson Lab. And in this experiment, scientists took liquid hydrogen and shot electrons at it. As you do. As mm -hmm. you do, right? Mm -hmm. So hydrogen, you've got hydrogen is the first element in the periodic table, right? It's just got a proton and a neutron right? They had lots of protons in hydrogen. So plentiful source, they shot electrons at it and then looked to see what happened as these electrons interacted with the protons and what right. happened. And as they did that, they were able to get information. The energy of these electrons was 6 billion electron volts, um, but it allowed them to study the quarks that were in the protons. It was enough power for them to delve in there. And assuming that the gluons pressure equals the quarks pressure, they were able to make a, a, an estimate of how much pressure is on the inside of a proton. You want to know how much it is? It's a lot. It's a lot, a lot, a lot. <laughs> so you think you're standing at sea level, right? One atmospheric pressure here on Earth, right? Mm -hmm. Right, one atmospheric pressure. Well, a proton center has a million, trillion, trillion times that. What? <laughs> okay. More, a, a higher amount of pressure than is found at the center of neutron stars. Wait, what? A, pr a proton. <sighs> A simple subatomic particle that's part of a particle that makes up everything has this massive amount of pressure. Holding so it together I guess, and keeping it from collapsing. A lot of energy in there. If you think about entropy, right, and you think about how the universe is expanding and all this stuff. Are you doing big, deep thoughts right now? Okay, you, I'll keep up. <laughs> <laughs> How do you keep together? How do you keep it together? Maybe it's all this internal pressure. Mm -hmm. It is the, the force. Of, yeah, it's the forces of these these gluons. Well, well uh, so that pull so it the, together. In a weird way, something comes to mind, uh, which is the birthplace of protons. You know, the Big Bang. Wait, wait, wait. Where did mattery stuff first get its characteristics? From this singularity, so from this big bang. And the reason that this is a weird thought, cross thought for me is I, I often think about this in terms of uh, microbes. Uh, they have internal tutor pressures. Yeah, and, I pressures always, yeah. and I always think like, well, what is that an indication of? You know, because a lot of like, that these pressures are equivalent to being, say, 10 feet deep in water or 40 feet deep in water. And is this where the birthplace of these microbes, the, the origin story of these microbes were in a highly pressurized environment underwater? Is that where their evolutionary start may have taken place? And they've conserved that internal pressure throughout existence. So I'm wondering if the proton's internal pressure isn't Sort of a an artifact that, that came with or inherited from some sort of pressure at the beginning of the Big Bang. It's a yeah. bigger it's a bigger it's, question than this story is addressing, but yeah. it's uh, yeah. but it's the first thing that uh, that popped into my head. Yeah, well, it's you know the gluons they transmit, and it's like how does a gluon transmit the strong nuclear force? Yeah. And it is this strong nuclear force that holds it all together that creates that really creates this pressure pulling all the pieces of the proton together. So where does that come from? How we don't understand that. How is it being transmitted? What is it, you know, <laughs> this is part of the universe. And in in this article, um, 
the this the pressure of a proton is as much a fundamental part of the proton as its electron is it as its electric charge being positive right um but it's something that we really didn't understand and, and there's still so much more to learn so it sounds like this science story is better than uh certain baked goods for expanding the mind <laughs> <laughs> I think so. But thinking of expanding the mind. Yeah. Speaking of expanding the mind. Oh, though, Alice in Wonderland's cookie? Wait. I got Alice there. Sorry. <laughs> we're not eating Alice's cookies. Not today. What we're doing, we're going to talk about mini brains, okay. mini Neanderthal brains. Justin, you remember, we've talked a lot. You bring up Neanderthal stories all the time. I do. Uh, you do, <laughs> yes. And so you, the name Svante Pabo probably oh, yeah. uh, is rings a bell. He is the uh, director of the genetics development, sorry, director of the de genetics department at the Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Germany. And what his lab is attempting to do now is use CRISPR to take human stem cells and change single point mutations basically change little aminos uh little uh not amino acids base pairs little bases in dna in the genome of these stem cells and turn them uh, to be closer to the ne neanderthal form of the genes and they're trying to address three genes that are involved in brain development and doing this, they're going to take these brain stem cells and look at how they develop. They're going to create mini brains. And we've talked about this organoid process before. It's not like, oh, we're just going to grow a Neanderthal brain. That's not what they're doing. But they are. But they would like to do. But anyway, not <laughs> Maybe yet. George so Church wants to do that. Is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really it's really funny. There's this wonderful article in The Guardian on this research, and um, they've interviewed Svante Pabo about this, and he comments on George Church and how George Church is very sensational and always um, how all we how he always brings up these kind of sensational ideas. And um, so even though even though they're talking about this kind of resurrection of Neanderthal biology, uh, George Church has suggested they could create a cloned Neanderthal baby if an adventurous female human were prepared to act as a surrogate. And Pabo says it's not only ethically unpalatable, but unachievable with today's technology. And he's, he finds comments like Church is frustrating because then other people like me have to look like the boring non-visionary guy saying it's not possible and think about the ethics. <laughs> Which I love that quote. It's just fantastic. Fair point. These renegade scientists just, you know, making grinding them... <laughs> on, on handrails and, and talking about, you know, radical science. Get out of here. Go back to school. Go back to school. Yeah. So these mini brains, these organoids are interesting because they, uh, instead of just having a single layer of cells growing in a dish, you can get a three dimensional little blob of cells. And within that blob, you can actually have multiple different cell types. And so you can have uh, different neurons and maybe um, glial cells, the support cells for the neural structures, maybe even blood vessels that could grow into them. And so in doing that and by shifting just a few of those developmental genes to be a little bit more Neanderthal-like, we could potentially see how Neanderthal brains connected up. And if those connections, whether they had similar action potential rates, whether they had similar um, activation and function to human brain blobs, <laughs> you know? So basically to find out, you know, is it's the invest investigating this idea of, is there stuff from the Neanderthals that uh, we're better without? That is it because we lost that, that our brains are special and we are who we are? Or are we going to find out that, oh, the Neanderthals were doing just fine before we came along so and their brains work the same. So this, this, interesting questions. It is, but it also it, it gives me an interesting question because within those, uh, within the lines of that question, there's the assumption that I didn't know, which is that we've tested our brains versus, say, chimpanzees in the mini brain 
scenario and we can see differences mm -hmm. between and i and i wasn't aware of that there are there are slight differences for sure i mean a lot of it is you know it's the it's structural and how the brain how the the bits of neurons how the synapses connect to each other and how they how they work together yeah there are differences it's pretty right. cool but that is my last intro story. And I believe, Justin, you have, you've got your Denisovan story, Denisovan brain, if you want to go there, no. or we can talk about memory. No, no. Well, you so that I, story up there. We got to yeah, jump into these I, things. I don't have a, Den a, a Denisovan story. Oh, no. Uh, it's in the Naledi. But uh, yeah, I'll go to memory. What is a memory, you may ask someday? Is it something stored in the brain? Like a file on a computer, only a biological neuronal brain file. Right? That's what it is? That would well, make yes. sense. Yes, that's what it is. And also, maybe not. Uh, engram is a word that sciencey people use as a stand-in for a hypothetical permanent change in the brain accounting for the existence of memory, also known as a memory trace a physical place where memory is stored. However, some types of memory may actually be stored epigenetically in our RNA. That's also a hypothesis. And it's one with some intriguing new evidence uh, as demonstrated by a study of sea snails published in eNeuro. David Glansman tested the possibility that RNA from a trained California sea hare, yes. a type of sea snail, uh, Ellipsia californica, can be used to create an engram memory storage memory trace by way of RNA transferred from one organism to another. So he trained the, the sea snails by implanting tiny wires into their tails, giving them a series of shocks while prodding them in the siphon which is some sort of fleshy spout thingy. That's, yeah. what gonna, that's what I'm going to say to my child. Child, I'm going to move or I'm going to prod you in the siphon. In the siphon. <laughs> yeah, so these they're not snails. They're slugs. No. Yeah. That is something that this, the, slugs, all the that reports the, the, have gotten wrong. They're okay. sea slugs. Yeah, I, there were them. there were a few studies this week that had headlines that totally miscategorized animals. This was one of them, mm -hmm. and the one I'm doing later also has the same problem. But yes, well, they're sea well, slugs. They're called sea, sea hares. Slugs. Okay, I'll correct yeah. from here on out. Although sea the yeah. fact yeah. that it's a sea hare what made me think of a a underwater rabbit. Mm -hmm. which, yeah, well, they have these little more confusing. They have these little projections snake. on them that look like bunny ears. I was just showing. I'll screen share again, but that's where they get their name from. It's pretty adorable. I love them. <laughs> and these and these uh, yeah, these are. organisms are a model organism for neurophysiology. It's like you, in my neurophysiology training, this is one of the first animal models that you learn about for things like sensitization and habituation and how basic uh, neural entrainment occurs. And so um, it's, I'm, I'm not surprised they used this, this particular animal to do this experiment. So they've got the, they got the wires in the tail of the uh, sea slug and, and they, they prod it in the siphon while shocking it to, to train <laughs> it to respond. And it does, it responds uh -huh. by contracting gills in a noticeable defensive posture. Ah, so uh, Glansman then extracted RNA from the snails and injected that RNA into sea slugs. I keep saying snails. I'm going to keep doing it. Into sea slugs that had not been sensitized. So RNA out of the slug that's got the shocker treatment, uh, RNA into slugs that had not had the treatment. And the result? The new slugs reacted as if they had undergone the shock treatment. Dun, dun, dun. Experiments illustrate that parts of the memory trace and gram are held in RNA rather than the connectivity of brain cells. Genetic memory is a thing. Quotey voice, Landsman. Ish. No. What we are, what, <laughs> what we are talking about are very specific kinds of memories, not the sort that says what happened to me on my fifth birthday, 
which he doesn't go into any further, or who is the president of the United States. So it's different than those forms of memory. Still, the research could indicate that memory exists not just in specific locations in the brain or broken up across regions of the brain, but throughout the genome. So this is especially interesting. I read the story. I loved it because we've studied other species of animals where we see generations learn, quote unquote, from previous generations. Like crows are a great example that crows will never experience a certain thing, and we've will seen know to plants. react a certain way. And we've, we've seen, seen it plants. plants. So we've seen it in a lot of uh animals, but also, yeah, in other forms of life. And the assumption has been that there's an information transfer um, outside of the corporeal, right? Somehow that maybe crows are teaching their babies to avoid a certain person or things like this. But there could be an epigenetic reasoning behind it that doesn't involve smarts or communication. For certain things, there might be some things that come into their DNA and actually, you know, transfer to next generations that way. It's pretty interesting. And, 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 so and, here's, here's, here's. He's holding back, holding back mm. softly with the rebuttal. The oh, story. yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, but I do, I do believe like even animal instinct and all these things that we see in these behaviors, even amongst plants, where if you, if you de de deprive a plant of, of its normal watering season, uh, the next, not the next, maybe the generation after has adapted to that new climate. Uh, these are things that are possible, we know, even without a brain for a genetic memory or a genetic, uh, uh, a genetic change of strategy to take place. However, there is some skepticism uh -huh. about this study. Like me, I am so skeptical of this study and yeah, nobody's giving me a chance to talk about no, it no, yet. This is, that was the intro to you saying the thing oh, where you're going to... <laughs> no, no, no. That's I was. That was my transition. To, uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I want to hear it. It's been all over the interwebs. I wanna it's hear all it. over the interwebs, and so um, we don't know exactly what the RNA did when it got when it was injected. We don't know how it acted. We don't know. They're saying epigenetic because yeah, RNA is involved in some epigenetic aspects of DNA expression. So potentially that's what's going on, but they did not show that in their experiment. That's not what has been proven. And it is a, that is a guess. And so this is a new hypothesis that needs to be tested and they need to determine exactly what's happening in the nucleus of these nerve cells. Now, memory for the most part, we know is uh, that long-term potentiation at the area of the synapses is involved with this habituation and this sensitization process. But there's something that must happen in the nucleus of the cells to make memories less than a, uh, a momentary fleeting thing. For a memory to be a lasting memory, there has to be a change that uh, that stays there. And you guys are talking about instinct and all that other cut stuff. And that's an even more permanent change because that's happening in the sex cells, the reproductive cells that change has to happen to have that passed on epigenetically at that level. So jumping to in this this whole thing is leap, 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 leap yeah. of, uh, you know, of hypotheses. And it's missing the fact that RNA works at very short time scales. And what this does not show is the transfer of a memory. What it shows is the transfer of this sensitization, that something happened to sensitize the, the siphon neuron to stimuli. It did not sensitize, it did not, the, the, this is this, you know, the use of language is important here because we do not know based on this experiment that the memory of the siphon sensitization process of I poke you in the siphon, I poke you in the siphon, oh look, you're sensitized now, that that process is transferred over. All we know is that the behavior has changed. Right. So we can't we, test for if they remember being poked in the siphon, which okay. is what the implication right. is. So, that's so the for I'm, memory, that's the implication. There is some there is sensitization that has occurred. It is not as though it is now a learned thing. So one organism learned it, the other one now has the behavior. The question is 
what is the RNA doing? And what they put in there is a big soup of RNA on top of it. They're like, let's take all the What's RNA out of nothing specific. They took all the RNA. They use this uh, trisol process, which just isolates RNA. That's it. It takes the, it precipitates the RNA. Researchers can take that RNA and just shove it wherever they want to shove it. And in this case, <laughs> they shoved it into the neck of a sea slug. And somehow from that general injection, right. all that RNA migrated to the right neurons and something happened. But we don't know what RNA is responsible. We don't know where it's acting. They're guessing it made it to the nucleus. <laughs> Long-term change. But it didn't have to do that. It could have been acting at the level of the synapse as well. It could be acting at the at the synapses where long-term potentiation takes place. They need more study. Bah, Absolutely. Absolutely. I, but this I, is I, an important I, I, concept because if, if this had been a study yeah, but I know. I know you're putting a very high mark for for them to be able to prove that they proved anything. Oh but yeah, because been, you know what? I but, but, learning in memory. Sure. Like but if this had been a study in which, in two separate enclosures, one sea slug was undergoing sensitization, sens uh, the sensitization, uh, sensitization of the shock treatment, and in the next chamber with a clear <laughs> view of it. There was another sea snail that was just allowed to observe however uh, sea slugs do this. You might say, aha, they can observe and learn a behavior. But it's only because this goes against, I think, some, some previous dogma or some previous teaching that there is such a pushback. If you had constructed and had a different study, you, I think people would just say, aha, they can learn a behavior. And it no, would have been I mean, I I want this because we are looking for the explanation for memory. We want memory researchers yeah. want to know how it works. I love the I love the concept of it being RNA driven epigenetic changes, and I think this is a step in that trajectory. I think they're moving along the right path. There's just the what I'm upset about is the uh, the language use to say that they've transferred a memory from one organism to another because they have not. And that it, the, the headlines that everybody's seeing in, are making yeah. people think that now we know how to transfer memories yes. and Absolutely. we know much more about it that we, than yeah. we do. And, and this concerned. might this might have something to do with the scientists and the press release that they had. Mm -hmm. It has a lot to do with um, picking keywords out of that press release and extrapolating. Sure. Uh, but so, I, I, what I'm what I want to find out is what we can say from this is that we can transfer a learned a behavior. Response. Or a, or a behavioral response. A, beha a neural response. Mm -hmm. A behavior. From, a a, a, yeah. And in, in this case, they're looking at the behavior of the slugs. They're also looking at the behavior of the neurons. So both. Right. So yeah. from RNA. So a learned mm -hmm. response from RNA transferred to another individual. That's still pretty interesting. Yeah, well, um, very interesting. interesting. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's no, but that's that's pretty cool. I think that um it it opens up more questions than we had yes, before. As, absolutely, you know, yeah. it does. But I don't see the harm in calling it a memory. Like just for the for the if you're worried about what the 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 person on the street who isn't listening to this show or hasn't been, looked into it before, fantastic, spark the imagination, great. I think what we shouldn't allow to happen is that too much criticism <laughs> of the study take place because it's remarkable. And I think that if we were had this in any other context, and again, I think it's because we're too being too sensitive about what a memory is. No, I think you want to be excited person. about this study, which is fine. You should be excited about this study, but we do need to be careful about language. We do need to tell people when sensationalism is taking things too far, and we do need to require extraordinary evidence for extraordinary claims. Yes. So and this I think is if my you question. Have a past as a neurologist. <laughs> this is, no, this is, this is my question study. for Kiki. Which I, think, <laughs> I, know, right? I think this will clear it up a little bit. If this How, is what I studied in grad school. I don't. I can't even keep it straight if it's a snail or a slug. So I mean, I'm not. I'm again. I'm. I, I would. Like, I would there's another that. group of people who are like, you can't call it a snail, Justin, because. 
That's not that's what Blair's doing on one side and the other side. You can't call it a memory, Justin, because it's a learned behavior. When I don't really see the difference between a snail and a slug or a learned behavior and a memory. To me, they're pretty equal. So my question is, can you give me an example or an idea of an experiment where you could prove that something is a memory and not a learned behavior? Because I think that's what some of us are struggling with. I think it's How can well, you anytime know? you train an animal, a dog to do a not trick. Not necessarily, because, a because certain, you can train things that are a behavior that are not based in memory, necessarily. So, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, really no, you yeah, I mean, to disprove this isn't memory. This, what I'm saying. Yes. So the question is how long for it to be a memory in the new organism. Mm -hmm. So yes. it, it was a memory, a learned behavior that became a memory, the sensitization that lasted for a period of, you know, for a long period of time in aplysia number one, RNA added to aplysia number two led to changes in its behavior. But does that mean that that aplysia now has that memory encoded? How long is that memory going to, is, is that behavior going to last? Is it going to last as long as it did in snail number one? Snail. <laughs> I, know I said that on purpose. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that slug just a homeless so, snail? Isn't that what that is? In some <laughs> way. If that slug got a shell, wouldn't it become a snail? But I, it's uh, a bunny. It's a bunny. So let's let's just yeah, stop. it's a hair. <laughs> hair. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So I mean the difference is, is it is it a long, is it a long-term memory in the new in the new sea slug now? Is it now encoded into its neurons so that that's the way it's going to respond you know like every time you, there's some noise over in the corner you turn and you go squirrel you know if that's yeah. your yeah your if Pavlov's behavior. dogs drool mm -hmm. despite the fact that they weren't the dogs that were trained but they had the rna from the dogs that were trained uh injected into it, their necks and if it I, is I, if, I i don't see that as any takeaway from how and I'm calling that a memory and yeah. and it might it not be depends. a memory that you access as oh I revisit and recollect uh, right well that's different that's episodic memory which is yeah. different so, from so this, uh, this is, I think it fits anyway and but the so but I, another point here is now what we're getting into is the molecular basis of memory and so this is going to in open up some interesting conversations and questions and experiments because the question is, what, what does that uh, sensitized neuron look like? What is its RNA makeup? Which ones, what are, the, what are the epigenetic changes that have taken place, right? You, that's what we want to look at now and see if you take that RNA and you move it or you take the right selection of RNA and you put it into another organism, do those same epigenetic changes occur? Do those same, you know, what RNA is responsible? Um, and then I think once we start, I mean, this is reductionist for sure, but you get to a point where you can say, this is a memory. It's, it looks exactly the same in both neurons. And, and I don't think it necessarily, well, I'm going to say it doesn't necessarily interact with neuronal tissue, but then I'm going to say that it, you know, um, interacts with uh, the nervous system, which is of yeah. course that. But what if it what if this is just that? What if the RNA somehow connects to the nervous system and and is looking for a signal and in sending the signal to react to? I mean this is a, these are some it's really downloading the, the program and the it never happens in the brain. I know Kung Fu. Are you okay that you learn Kung Fu without it being done downloaded to the brain. How does itself. the RNA get in there? I want to know how does it go from outside the neurons to inside the neurons to inside it, the nucleus? So that's neurons. the next if that's anybody, the next thing. How does it do that? Yeah. You know, that's what they're saying. Ribosome that creates a protein that goes and lands somewhere that's that's looking for this change. Like this is like a fascinating thing, but your memory might not be all in your head. <laughs> And, and and in some but but if it is it's fine you've got plenty of space in your head unlike recently discovered species homo naledi yes which had a very small brain 
hominidally speaking, but that brain may have been much more useful than we might have guessed based on its size. New research by Ralph Holloway and colleagues, uh, which also includes researchers from the University of Witwatersrand, Johannesburg, South Africa, published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, examines the endocasts of the Naledi skull. Uh, Kiki, what's an endocast? An endocast is when you take a, I guess, like a plaster cast of the inside of the brain case. Yeah, imprints the brain makes <laughs> on the skull casing, yeah. right? And it shows you a lot about the folding and the regions and the size of the bulginess over here and a little nodal thing over there of what the brain that long since decayed and was swept away by the winds of time. Uh, research highlights a human-like shape of Naledi's tiny brain. This is interesting uh, because this uh, species, thanks to geologists back in 2017-ish, uh, they found that the Naledi lived in southern Africa between 236 and 335,000 years ago, a time when Homo sapiens were already running around. So no, this is not an ancestor in the classical sense, but it has a very humanish brain. Uh, researchers piece together traces of Homo naledi's brain shape from the collection of skull fragments, partial crania, and at least five adult individuals. One of these bore a very clear imprint of the convolutions of the surface of the brain's left frontal lobe. Cody voice from Ralph Holloway. This is the skull I've been waiting for my whole career. Very excited. The anatomy of Naledi's frontal lobe was similar to humans, very different from great apes. Naledi wasn't alone. Uh, other members are genus Homo erectus, Homo habilis, and even the small brained hobbits, Homo floriensis, also share features of the frontal lobe with us modern humans. If you go back further, Australopithecus africanus, much more ape like in this part of the brain. So, this is very much a uh, modern hominid kind of brain shape. Uh, Cody voice from Sean Hurst. It's too soon to speculate about language or communication in Homo Naledi, but today human language relies upon this brain region. He's also a co-author of the study. Uh, the back of the brain also showed human-like changes in Naledi compared to more primitive hominins. Uh, human brains are usually asymmetrical. Left brain displaced forward relative to the right. I didn't know that. I thought we were pretty symmetrical, but it turns out we aren't. The team found signs of this asymmetry in one of the most complete Naledi skull fragments. They also found hints that the visual area of the brain in the back of the cortex was relatively smaller in Naledi than in chimpanzees, which is very human-like because we also share this. Uh, great. So, uh, brains of Homo naledi raise new questions. It says here about the evolution of human brain size, the sort of cost of evolving a big brain, needing to uh, have richer diets to support it, hunting, gathering, longer childhoods, delving into the arts. Uh, but that scenario doesn't seem to work well for Homo naledi, which had hands well suited for tool making, long legs, human like feet, teeth that suggest a high quality diet. According to study co-author uh, uh, John Hodgson, Naledi's brain seems like one you might predict for, for Homo habilis two million years ago. But habilis didn't have such a tiny brain. Naledi did. Hom a human-like brain organization might mean that Naledi shared some behaviors with humans, mm. despite having that tiny brain. Uh, Lee Berger, uh, Berger, who's actually, I think, the uh, the person who discovered Homo naledi uh, is also a co-author in the paper, suggests that the recognition of Naledi's small but complex brain will also have a significant impact in the study of African archaeology. Archaeologists have been too quick to assume that complex st uh, stone tool industries were made by modern humans, with Naledi being found in southern Africa at the same time, the same place that the Middle Stone Age industry emerged, Maybe we've had the story wrong the whole time. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So I, I we don't have DNA, <laughs> Naledi DNA yet. Yeah. Right? So 
But this is going to be my prediction for Naledi. Naledi's a not distant cousin. That's my guess. Really human-like brain uh, features. There's going to be morphological differences. Uh, but uh, I think I think we're probably looking at one of those braided stream scenarios, where this is this is one of those not too distant cousins who we have the same uh, you know uncle grandpa with or something. Right? <laughs> like we're, it's going to be a pretty. I bet we're going to be a lot closer to Naledi than we think. And then that makes then and then the question would be, what was the other side of that? Ooh, what was the other side of that? Hmm. What no? These are all good questions. It's fascinating. I there's seriously, it seems like this is like the golden age for archaeology and for I mean, there's so many new techniques for looking at these old fossils to get. Uh, we're finding more fossils and we're also, we've got new techniques to look at them and these new ideas are really popping up and I, it's fascinating. It is. the I think it's the golden age of science right now. And, yeah. and, and <laughs> one of the things I thought was funny, this is a side note, but there's, there's, they've been a lot of genetic research now and, and inquiry and investigation and discovery is done through what's called next generation sequencing techniques. And they're already coming up with new ones that are more advanced. So then uh, how do you go from the next generation thing to the, what is it, next, next or next plus? Like it's starting to become like the, the changes and the advancements <laughs> come so rapidly. You should just, you know, come up with, you, you can't be too optimistic about how forward your technology is because three years from now, it will be the old way. <laughs> oh, remember when we used that next generation technology? Oh, yeah, those were the good days three years ago. All right. <laughs> no, exactly. This is this is the F two generation, then the F three generation. We're going to have to start using uh, ancestry type terminology. or uh, this this weekend. That's right. Uh, yeah. This weekend technology. This week. yeah. Just this week. All right, but you know what time it is right now? What? time is it it's time for blair's animal corner she loves our creature great and small by pet mill a pet no pet at all if you want to hear about animals she's your girl except for giant pandas and squirrels and a what you got, Blair? I have a breakthrough in oh. sex determination. I am so excited. So with hit with with mammals, humans, we have genetic based sex determination, right? So females have XX, males have XY, females always give an X, the good old Punnett square, males give an X or a Y, they figure it out, whatever, fine. So you end up with an XX or an XY, male, female, born at birth. Um, Sex determination in many reptiles, including turtles and tortoises, are a little more complicated. They have temperature-dependent sex determination. We've talked about before at the show how climate change is causing sea turtles to skew female because of this. Warmer temperatures create female turtles. Cooler temperatures create male turtles. There are some uh, exceptions to that rule, but for the most part, with turtles, Warmer is female, cooler is male. Um, and that usually works in nature because there's a nest and there's hundreds, thousands of eggs sometimes. And in the center, it's the warmer area. On the edges, it's cooler. So you get this nice usual 50-50 split of the, the sexes at birth. But we've known this for about 50 years, but nobody knows why or how this happens. A new study from Duke University and Zhejiang Wanli University in China have made a breakthrough. So definitely not in the DNA sequence itself. They have identified a molecule that affects how genes are expressed, but it does not alter the underlying genetic code. This is the very first functional evidence of a molecular link connecting temperature with sexual development ever. So 
these researchers took common pond turtles, often see them as pets. They're invasives here in California. They're called red-eared pond sliders. Eggs incubated at 32 degrees Celsius, which is about 88 degrees Fahrenheit, produce female hatchlings. 26 degrees Celsius, about 79 degrees Fahrenheit, hatches males. So they took cooler egg incubation temperatures and they turned up a key gene called KDM6B. Catchy of name. Of course they did. Yes. <laughs> KDM6B in the turtle's immature sex or organs, aka gonads. Then uh, they saw that this gene, KDM6B, acted as a biological on switch, which activated other genes, allowing testes to develop. They took a group of freshly laid turtle eggs, incubated them at the two different temperatures, and looked for differences in the way the genes were turned on or off during early development of gonads before their fate as ovaries or testes. So they tried a bunch of different genes, turned them on and off, on and off, like a light switch. <laughs> and then um, they found that this KDM6B became more active at cooler incubation temperatures and was almost silent at warmer female producing temperatures. They then suppressed KDM6B in turtle gonads to see how it affected their sexual development. And this turned what would have been testes in the testy forming temperature into the testy. <laughs> ovaries. The testy. Ah, it worked. They looked further, found the protein encoded by KDM6B interacts with a region of the genome called, another catchy name, DMRT1, <laughs> which acts as a master switch to turn on testy development. So KDM6B activates DMRT1, quiz later, by modifying histones, which are the ball-like proteins that DNA is wrapped around, okay? Um, and so the tail of histone proteins has chemical markers on it, methyl tags, that keep genes along the DNA molecule inactive. This is and, all epigenetics. Yes. And so KDM6B turns on DMRT1 by removing the methyl tags, loosening the histone tails, which makes the DNA easier to access and read. So the DNA making testes are hidden at the higher temperatures, the cooler temperatures, KDM6B runs in there, turns on DMRT1, DMRT1 pulls out this section of DNA that is otherwise usually silenced. So they say it's like removing the brakes off the male pathway. This suggests that similar molecular mechanisms work in other reptiles too. There's a lot of reptiles that have this, bearded dragons, crocodiles and alligators. And so this, Obviously, is just an open door for more study, but this is what really got me is, okay, it's been 50 years. We figured out they have temperature-dependent sex determination. We don't know how the heck it happens. We have a clue, but nobody can figure out yet what is sensing the change in heat because so, co cooler incubation temperatures increase gene activity in testes, but in no other organs. So... What is the temperature sed sensing trigger that is causing this KDM6B to do something in the gonads? So that's the next study that this group of scientists wants to do. What is sensing the temperature? But now RNA. they know how they respond to yeah. it. Oh, yeah, it's RNA. It's so RNA. Get RNA. It, yeah. <laughs> so, it's, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So it's, oh, yeah. I mean, that's kind of what I'm thinking. Like, it's, I mean... It could be RNA. It could be uh, the proteins that the RNA is transcribed into by the ribosome because at different temperatures, they can fold a mm -hmm. little bit differently. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's there's uh, in, internal cell uh, structures can change a little bit with temperature. And it might be, mm -hmm. you know, this is one of those conserved universal structures that can, it's like, Right. How? But the, the really weird question is that this this one thing isn't acting differently anywhere else in the body. So there's okay. something in the gonad area that is reacting to temperature that is signaling this like domino effect. Right. And I and, and that's I think what I, looking for. But, I, but that's I don't know if it's that much. I mean, 
I mean, because this is one of the one of the conserved uh, uh, architectures that has very different directions, right? Like you could you could uh, if we if we sort of put if I put it in a different way, um, uh, all men have nipples, right? But there's not a temperature change that makes us have uh, uh, arms where those nipples are. So. So, but I mean, this is this is a structure that can go different ways depending on the the the, the RNA and the, the molecule structures that are there to start down one process or the other. So, if they're folded slightly different or don't unfold enough to go in one direction or the other, I can see why but that would. Just but the be thing enough. is, but but you're thinking of it kind of from a mammalian perspective, which is like where our body temperature is always the same, whereas in these reptiles they're much more often going to be ectothermic. They're going to be getting their uh, their body temperature coming from the environment. And so, you know, in, in mammals, the testes are very often external, the gonad, you know, and especially during development, it's a very, you know, in, in utero or versus being in an egg, these are very different situations. Um, and so the issue is, so we're thinking of, if you're thinking of a turtle, or a, a crocodile, or one of these organ, or a snake, even that's um, that is developing in an egg, and it, the temperature changes significantly. All of the tissues, all of the stuff of that of that reptile, should be affected, mm -hmm. but instead, only the sexual development right. is being affected. Right. So this Why? section, this section yeah. of the genome is being exposed and released in the only testes that. at this lower only. temperature, but only. only there, not in the liver, not. not in the lungs, nowhere else is this area of the genome being affected. Yeah. So there's mm -hmm. something going on in the gonad in relation to temperature. And so that's their next step. But I am so excited or about this. Or maybe it's not in the gonad. Maybe it's in, you know, the, the hypothalamic pituitary right. Right. gonadal axis. You know, mm -hmm. maybe it's mm -hmm. hormones being sure. affected in another area of the brain that are, you know, there could be some kind of pathway yeah. external to the gonads, but we don't right. know that yet. Right. So we have the starter domino, which is the temperature. We yeah. have most of the dominoes now leading to cr the creation of testes or ovaries. We're missing one or two dominoes in between. Yep. And that's what they're trying to figure out. But before we only had the first and the last one, and that was it. And so this is, this is a huge gap that has been filled in scientific knowledge about oh, the yeah. about the development of turtles and tortoises, which is first of all, just amazing at coming from a person who's been talking about this their entire life, but don't have specific answers about it. Getting some answers is so cool. But on top of that, turtles and tortoises around the world are being affected by climate change due to changing temperatures and changing sex ratios. The more we know about the mechanism behind it, the better chance we have of saving species, which is pretty cool. Moving on <laughs> no. um, to a little, a little more lightweight story, less uh, fancy figures and, and, uh, and, and names of genes and things. This is a very simple idea. Uh, you want to boost your economy. You want to create more jobs. Hire some kestrels. So uh, wait, <laughs> this, at least in the state of Michigan, this is a study coming out of Michigan State University. They wanted to see the impact of of promoting kestrels hanging out on farms. Okay, so kestrels- I have, to, I have to pause you. Yeah. I have no idea what a kestrel is. I'm just or about to tell you. So a where kestrel- a a ke Okay, so a kestrel is America's smallest bird of prey. They're so, so cute. I have, here I have a little picture next to my highlighted notes. This oh is a kestrel, gosh, this is an American like kestrel. Eagle. So actually they're closely related to falcons, which is where um, we were talking about the sea slugs being called sea snails in the news. That There were a bunch of headlines calling kestrels hawks, which I was just like, I wanted to pull my hair out. They're falcons, they're related to falcons. And so as other falcons like peregrine falcons, they eat many things, including birds. So falcons are famous for eating birds. They have really specific uh, wing development and feather dynamics so that they have hairpin turns in the, in the air and they have some of the fastest speeds in the world. The peregrine falcon is the fastest animal in the world. They dive over 200 miles an hour. So 
These animals do all this to be able to catch other birds and eat birds. So the benefit of encouraging these little tiny little birds of prey, so adorable, to hang out on your farm is that they will reduce the amount of fruit eating birds on your farm. So <laughs> I, I quickly looked up the uh, talk, top exports in Michigan where this study took place. They export um, soybeans, feed grains, vegetables, fruits, and dairy products. Those are their main exports. And their fruits are things like blueberries, apples, cherries, things of that nature. So a lot of stone fruits and uh, berries and apples. So knowing that, um, they this specific study was done on a cherry farm. And the way they promoted kestrels to hang out, they made some kestrel nest boxes on the farm. So uh, bird, these birds will make their own nests, but if there's a box nearby that is a good habitat for them, they will gladly take it. And so they, by building these nest boxes, encouraged a bunch of kestrels to come hang out. This reduced the pests in the farm, not surprising. And then they measured the improvement on the farm. And this is where it gets interesting. So they wanted to look at the benefit to cost ratios for building the nest boxes, because that's not cheap. It's more expensive than buying a, a bottle of some sort of repellent or something. But they found that for every dollar spent, 84 to $357 of cherries were saved from fruit eating birds. Wow. Wow. This is now, insane. That's fantastic. Yes, this now is we a just need macro to train them to go after cane toads. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gotta... That would be perfect. So this is a regional model. So then they extrapolated from that. They saw that um, each farm could generate potentially 46 to 50 new jobs by adding kestrels to their farm. And they found also that through this research, bringing kestrels onto farms would benefit Michigan with new jobs and more than $2 million in increased revenue over five years. So this is a really good reminder that natural pest reduction and working with nature in harmony with nature in agriculture often is at the benefit of everyone involved. So this is this is a good this reminder a, of that. This yeah. is another study. I mean, you've brought a few of these. And yeah. this just seems to be kind of I, I like seeing this being a trend in the in the science and also in the uh, agricultural practices. And yeah. from what I, I, I was reading a, an interesting article out of UC Davis recently about uh, this transfer of research information into agricultural practice. And mm -hmm. agriculture is one of those areas where, and ranching, uh, food production is one of those areas where people, the people who are doing it are actually following the research very closely because it'll make what they do more efficient and make more money yeah. for them and also make better food for everybody else. Yeah, absolutely. It's a win-win. And if you're mm -hmm. worried about the fruit eating bird populations, you should know that birds are only about 2% of kestrel diets, but having them around keeps birds away from the orchards. Yeah. So, it's like having that fake owl statue to yeah. keep the pigeons away. But you yeah, know, the, exactly. we eventually learn that the fake owl statue doesn't work and they sit on top of it. But uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is a, a reminder. Stay out of the these here parts, even though the kestrels aren't going to town on the bird populations per se. It's enough to keep them away. So living in, in harmony with nature might be um economically advantageous wait how is that in Ooh. harmony with nature we finally found a way to get rid of more birds i don't by, know by adding scaring birds. them away adding birds to scare mm -hmm. birds away it's yeah not and and not trying to eradicate these animals oh, in another yeah. way okay so yeah lesser of, of some sort of vague evils right and it, because evil. we're getting towards the end of the show anyway i'll just throw my quick news out here Please while do. we're at it um so justin already guessed at the top of the show whose bed is cleaner yours or a chimpanzee's that's right it's the chimpanzee so a study from north carolina state university looked at the ecosystem 
of a human bed and a chimp bed. They found that 35% of bacteria in human beds come from our own bodies, fecal, oral, and skin. And they took swabs of 41 chimpanzee beds, or nests as they call them. They were they test for microbial biodiversity there. At 15 of the nests, they used vacuums to sample arthropods, insects, and arachnids. They found chimpanzee beds had different biodiversity from human ones. Not surprising. But what was surprising was that chimpanzee beds had a greater diversity of microbes, but the those microbes reflected the trees that the nests were made out of and had much less fecal, oral, or skin bacteria. They found almost none of those microbes in the chimpanzee nests. Ew. Yeah. They also found very <laughs> few arthropods. Is, we live in a, a probiotic nest. Number one, I don't want any spiders in my bed. Number yeah. two... <laughs> I got to I'm going to go clean my sheets again. Yeah, change your <laughs> sheets. So in, in all of the chimpanzee nests that they they I want studied, fecal matter in my bed. Come on. They only found four ectoparasites. That's not four species, four individuals. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So th they say that in some ways our attempts to clean to create a clean environment for ourselves may actually make our surroundings less ideal well we spend a lot more time sleeping in the same bed night after right. night after Chimpanzees night. And... change their bed every night well no but i mean and okay. we mean do they really yeah oh well there you go uh and on top of that it's not your sheets kiki it's uh, the mattress it's, it's everything mattress. oh i know Ooh, no, yikes. I so, so are you saying you have... my 12 year old mattress is is it's if you your, for a change your, out, your twelve-year-old mattress is a bed of microbes. So, so fun, fun story from Justin's past. Uh, for for a very short time, I was a door-to-door -door vacuum salesperson. Oh yes. And one of the examples that we would use it was a high-end uh, bagless vacuum. We take a, a a black piece of filter paper and put it over the part that normally goes right into the vacuum container. And then just do a couple of passes over a mattress. And then you'd open it up and there would be a caked on oh, layer yuck. of dead skin cells. That's uh, disgusting. And you'd always try to use it near the bottom of the bed near the, where the feet are. Because the feet are constantly exfoliating. Um, but, you know, think of it in terms of taking yourself into a probiotic wrap. <laughs> Right, like this it's is actually sure. like a, a probiotic spa while you sleep. It's fantastic. It's oh, symbiosis God. in action. That's yeah. right. Uh, is that all your stories, Blair? That's all I got tonight. Okay, Justin, do you have any more? I got uh, just a quick blurbity blurb thing. This is uh, researchers reporting link between records of lead pollution uh, in Greenland's ice cores, and they've tied it to economic fluctuations throughout history. So they can actually see this is this is a uh, Joseph R. McConnell and colleagues. They precisely dated measurements of lead pollution and Greenland ice cores from 1100 BCE to 800 CE to uncover links between estimated lead emissions and the history of world economies. So they can actually see when there's when there's economies booming and busting uh, based on how much how much of uh, this lead ended up in the atmosphere. So they found out uh, that lead pollution increased during the Phoenician expansion. It peaked under the Roman Empire. And, and then when there was a big plague, uh, there was a lot less lead pollution. So, so human activity on planet Earth can be revealed through lead samples in ice cores. That's that's awesome. Mm -hmm. We're leaving a mark. Ice cores have so much to teach us. They never forget. <laughs> yes. Ice cores, it's right, unless they melt. And, and actually, even then, they <laughs> got to keep the fan on them. There's, uh, no, they found they found that yeah. that. Well, I can't remember how long ago it was. There was some. So I did. I'm not going to report on it because I didn't have it. But but they could tell. Uh, they reevaluated temperatures, global temperatures, from some time a long time ago. Because of melted ice, when it was refrozen, they could tell whether when it was 
when when ice was melting or when it was rain falling mm, uh, right and so yeah they even even when they're melting they tell a story and my last story for the evening it has to do with that pesky common cold maybe someday mm. soon hopefully i don't know soon it probably is going to be five to ten years you know that vague in the future kind of thing but maybe someday there will be a treatment for the common cold <gasps> researchers just published in nature chemistry their results of a study trying to create a uh, a treatment for the rhinovirus which is the uh cause one of the main causes of the common cold or what we what we call the symptoms that we call the common cold what the virus does and others like it do is they hijack an enzyme that's called n meristoyl transferase otherwise known as nmt and they hijack nmt this enzyme to be able to create a protein shell to protect the viral genome so that they can replicate, 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 and make you sneezy and sniffly and not feel very great. So tests in the lab, not in any animals at this point in time, only in a dish, were able with a molecule that they have created, uh, tests in a dish were able to fight off rhinovirus, were able to block the ability of rhinovirus to hijack the uh, the enzyme in the first place, which meant that it couldn't reproduce. And so if this kind of a treatment could work in the future, it could potentially get you healthier faster. As long you as you don't need that fast. enzyme for anything. That's the big question, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's probably it just happened to be there for no reason whatsoever. No reason. <laughs> exactly. But I think it's great. I mean, this is you know, maybe one way instead of what they what they're looking at is instead of attacking and looking at one virus or another virus and how to fight these things, why don't we just get the uh, their the targets within our body if we can to see if we can block them from getting it in the first place? Can you imagine a nasal spray like your allergy spray that you take in the springtime and like you're like, oh, I'm fine. So this would be a preventative or it would be in response to getting the getting a cold? Um, it probably could be both. Oh, um, but give me it, both. <laughs> 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 but right now it's still a dream in a Petri dish in a lab. And in the meantime, best way to keep from getting a cold is to wash your hands and avoid sick people. <laughs> and rhinos. <laughs> and rhinos. That's right. Let's do that. Have and we stay done home it? when you're sick. Stay home when you're sick. Stay home when you're sick. That's right. That Don't I do. It. I'm home all the time, you guys. <laughs> now we're at home. <laughs> I don't go anywhere. Oh my gosh. Oh my goodness. Have we done it? Did we We've make it to the it. end of the show? We did it. We did it. All right, everyone. Then I would like to shout out to all of you out there who are with us right now in this moment. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Thank you for letting Twist be a part of your life today or your bus ride, you know, whatever, wherever we are with you. And to our, our wonderful helpers who helped to make this show possible, Fada, thank you for your help on the social media and the YouTube show descriptions. Those time codes are invaluable. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Without you, I wouldn't have audio files, or at least it would be a lot harder to get them. And Brandon, thank you for simulcasting us to Facebook. Thank you for all of your help all of you and what you do. Thank you to, for to those of you who help support us financially, those of you who have donated on PayPal and on YouTube. Special thanks to our Patreon sponsors, Keith Corsell, Tyrone Fong, Mark EO, Byron Lee, Kevin Parachan, Mark Hessenflow, Matt Sutter, Aaron Luthen, Flying Out, Christopher Rappin, Brendan Minish, Greg Briggs, Robert Gary S., Marjorie, Rudy Garcia, Robert Aston, Kurt Larson, Steve Lessiman, Ben Rothig, Sean Lamb, Greg Riley, Jim Drapeau, Lisa Slazuski, Christopher Dreyer, Brian Carrington, Jason Olds, John McKee, Paul, Rick Ramis, Artyom, Richard Porter, Sarah Chavis, Sean Bryant, Ulysses Adkins, Jacqueline Boyster, Ashish Pants, 
Jim Seabright, Brian Condren, Richard, Eric Knapp, Kyle Washington, Time Jumper 319, Bob Calder, Bill K, Jason Roberts, Matthew Litwin, Gary, Jack, Mark Mazaros, John Ratnaswamy, Craig Gladden, Eric Dyer, Tony Steele, Alex Wilson, Steve DeBell, Andy Grow, Joshua Fury, Charlene Henry, Harrison, Harrison Prather, Ken Hayes, Richard Onimus, G. Burton Lattimore, Paul Disney. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. If any of you out there would like to help us out on Patreon, you can find information at patreon.com slash thisweekinscience. You can also help us out simply by telling people about Twist and, um, you know, where they can find us, which is twist.org. On next week's show, we'll be back as usual on Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time with more great science coming your way. Broadcasting online twist.org slash live. You can watch and join our chat room there. You can also join us on YouTube, which is uh, twist.org slash YouTube. And if you can't make it live, don't worry. All of this stuff is archived. You can find us at the YouTube channel. You can also find us online, twist.org for our audio podcast. Thank you for enjoying the show. Twist is also available as a podcast. Just Google This Week in Science in your iTunes directory. Or if you have a mobile type device, you can look for Twist, the number four droid app in the Android marketplace, or simply This Week in Science in anything Apple marketplace -y. For more information on anything you heard here today, show notes will be available on our website. That's at www.twist.org, where you can also make comments and start conversations with the hosts or other listeners. Or you can contact us directly. Email Kirsten at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or Blair at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, somewhere in the subject line. Otherwise, your email will be spam filtered into a bloody island. You can also hit us up on the Twitter, where we are at TwistScience, at Dr. Kiki, at JacksonFly, and at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you'd like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember... It's all in your head. Or is it? Mm -hmm. Wrong, wrong mouse. <laughs> this week in science. This week in science. This week in science. This week in science, it's the end of the world. So I'm setting up shop, got my banner unfurled. It says the scientist is in, I'm gonna sell my advice. Show them how to stop the robot with a simple device. I'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand. And all it'll cost you is a couple of grand. Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science. This week in science. 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 This week in science. This week in science. 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 I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news. That what I say may not represent your views. But I've done the calculations and I've got a plan. If you listen to the science, you may just get understand. That we're not trying to threaten your philosophy. We're just trying to save the world from Jeopardy. Jeopardy and this week in science is coming your way so everybody listen to everything we say and if you use our methods instead of rolling a die we may rid the world of toxoplasma got the eye because it's this week in science Science. This week in science, science, science. This week in science, this week in science, science, science.
I've got a laundry list of items I want to address. From stopping global hunger to dredging Loch Ness. I'm trying to promote more rational thought. And I'll try to answer any question you've got. So how can I ever see the changes I seek when I can only set up shop one hour a week? This week in science is coming your way. You better just listen to what we say. And if you've learned anything from the words that we've said, then please just remember it's all in your head. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, science, this week in science, this week in science. This week in science, this week in science, this week in science, this week in science. And we have come to the end of another show. It's late at night. I don't want to go. Or maybe I do. I don't know. What about you? This is where I start um, musical theatering. Mm. Meow. I saw a study I... this week that said that anyone or 95% of people, no, 98.5% of people can be taught to swim. To to swim. To swim. I can't <laughs> see. Maybe it is time. It's over. But ninety eight point five percent of people can be taught to sing. Thank you. Only one point five percent of people are. What did they call it? Uh, there's a fancy word for it, but basically tone deaf. Yeah, the fancy word for. Yeah. Yeah. So only one point five percent. I think I've heard the word before. Oh, I got the odds. Oh my goodness. Um. Yeah, most people, we, I mean, communication, we speak all the time and yeah, not being able to, most people can learn. Some people yeah. need more training than others, but most people can learn the basics. Yeah. Singing. Um, I also wanted to ask you in the after show if you saw this whole uh, Yanny Laurel thing today. Oh, I did. Oh, yeah. No, I, I've been tweeting about it since yesterday. Oh, Okay. Yeah, I came across I, it yesterday, and I only hear Laurel. Okay. So Laurel. I read an article about it that was published mm -hmm. later on today about what was actually happening. Mm -hmm. And so the lower frequency sounds make up the beginning and end of the word Laurel. The yeah. higher frequency sounds make up Yanny. And so sometimes, depending on what, device you're listening on like on my phone i watched it um when i was still in bed so my volume was down very 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 low and i only heard yanny and then when i turned it up almost all the way to max you could hear laurel that's so you because yeah, you me. have you have young ears <laughs> perhaps now, now <laughs> I, yeah. having had a lifetime of concerts and clubs with no ear protection, yeah. <laughs> I have old ears with many damaged hair cells. I only hear Laurel, no matter how low or how high or which device I put it on. I've played it on every device. I Oh, that's yeah. funny. Yeah, nope. I, I hear nothing but Laurel. Nothing. And then uh -huh. I played it. Then I played it for my husband and my son. And they they heard Yeri. Yeri? Oh, <laughs> yeah. Laurel. So they heard both. They heard Yeri. Like. Yeah. yeah. Yeri. But, yeah. So it's so it's a combination of what, yeah, what your ears have been through, what mm -hmm. device you're listening on, and what frequencies you're sensitive to, and all these other things. So it's yeah. interesting. It was very interesting because I, I was very skeptical of it. And then yeah, I messed with my sound up and down, which I was surprised oh, yeah. and that I could have... still hear it because I too have been to many, many, many concerts up front in front of speakers with no ear protection. And maybe my hearing hasn't dropped off a cliff yet. I don't know. Not but yet. You're still young. You're still young. <laughs> Not still to mention playing. I played music and was inside the band space. So I was, yikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I recall us reporting on a billion episodes ago that uh, 
like rock musicians outside of drummers uh, tend to have excellent hearing, regardless of the number mm. of concerts that they perform at. Interesting. Like yeah. it's not. It's because like, they're drummers. behind the monitors. That's yeah. Interesting. Well, well, yeah, but there's there's still you know in that loud sound arena environment, and and playing music and being in a band, all this sort of stuff doesn't necessarily lead to hearing loss. If you're a drummer. <laughs> then you're more likely to leave. Right. There's something about like probably that it's not like there's probably certain types of peak crashing decibels that yeah. can do the so, damage that so we need a prolonged to find... experience doesn't do you, necessarily lead to. Do you have the link to it, Blair? Because we need to put it in the chat room so that oh Justin, what, Yanny and Laurel so just so that Justin can listen to Yanny and Laurel. Have you have you heard about this? So no, I don't know what this is. I came at the tail end. Yes. So there is this thing. It's kind of like the uh, white and gold blue dress. And gold. Yeah, it's like the dress was for black, vision. Yeah. It was not blue and black. I didn't see that. I thought that's what it was, though. It turned out to be <laughs> it blue was, and black. No, right? It was okay. the ugliest dress ever. I can't believe yikes. people wanted to wear it. Blah. Blah. It was not cute. Um, But anyway... <laughs> <laughs> but beyond the beyond my fashion approval, um, it was an interesting perceptive experience for most people because it had to do with the monitor you were looking at it on. It would had to do with right. the lighting and the context with which you were seeing it. Uh, so there were all sorts of perceptive aspects to how the dress came looked right. to you. And this is a new, this is a thing um, which is an audio version of this, Justin. Which is you listen to the sound file. And uh, tell us what you hear. I'm trying to find the sound file. I just, I, oh, it's the, if you click on the link I just put in there, it's the yeah, video at the very top of the, oh, it's the very first oh. thing you see. I didn't know it was a video. It it's a like video. A yeah. It looks like a picture. Um, why don't I have the video? At the, aha, wait, here we go. Okay, hang on. What do you hear, Yanni or Laurel? Waiting. Oh, waiting. What's with this? I thought I had the fast speed internet. Why am I waiting for a loading thing? I might have other windows open. Oh. Yeah. yeah it's no. saying Laurel over and over again. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so I heard Yanny the first time. Laurel. Laurel. It's just Laurel. Laurel. It's saying Laurel. It's just it just says Laurel. That's all it says let me, to me. Let me play with my volume. So yeah, and this is really interesting because on my computer I only hear Laurel. But on my phone, with the sound down barely on, I could only hear Yanny. And that was, you know, right. early this morning, I think. So it's and it's an interesting thing Very if weird. you can put it into audio into audio software and yeah. play with the uh high and low frequencies. You uh I mean, I don't think I can hear it. <laughs> I think I only hear Laurel no matter what. But you can play with the high and uh, high and low frequencies and some yeah, people. Yeah, I'm only able to hearing make it. Laurel. They don't say Yanny once. Yeah. I'm My husband... trying to like prime myself by just staring at the word Yanny on the screen. Yeah, it's and not... it's not helping. Oh yeah. noodles noodles hears Yanny. Yeah. I heard Yanny before, but I on my yeah, I my computer I can only hear. Yeah, it's fun. It's super fun. But they, uh, yeah, it's an interesting thing. It has to do with your audio device, what you're listening on. It has to do with your ears themselves. Um, there was an interesting NPR interview where a UC Davis re uh, researcher was saying that it also has to do with the noise in the recording, that the recording is not a clean recording, that there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's noise in it. And so if you could clean out the noise, that would probably get rid of the Yanny aspect of it entirely. I think people who hear Yanny have their brains wired wrong. <laughs> I don't know. Like I'm what? Like, and this and this is why the internet even gets it's split barely audible. Like it's the still... dress and Yanny. I'm team Laurel all the way. Yeah. I was team Yanny this morning. Now I'm team Laurel. <laughs> Wow. For you, maybe it had changes over the day when you get tired. Or, yeah, may, or maybe. Tired. Here, let me see now. Depending on where you hit the link, 
one of them says Yanni. Maybe it prop maybe it populates differently. You know how like you don't have the yeah. same Google ads yeah. that I have. Your Facebook ads are different than mine. Maybe it just switches it up once in a while <laughs> and like throws out a Yanni <laughs> at you, and no. then you're like, oh no, now I hear Yanni, even though it's a different link. No, you have to listen to it with other people, and it's the you'll yeah you'll, you'll all hear different things. Weird. Yeah, it's I, I can't hear now. I think you're right. I think my ears are tired. Your ears are tired. I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, I did it as the very first thing I heard this morning. I woke up. I was like scrolling through social media before I got out of bed. So maybe my ears are just fresh as daisies. But they're so, so different. So the right? there. They're so different. different. There. It's not there. It sounds like this. Yeah. <laughs> It sounds very robotic. The Laurel sounds like an actual person, but Annie sounds very uh, robotic when you don't hear it. hear that at all. Oh, wait, I just didn't hear it. I heard it just one time. Yanny. Oh, there it is. Again. Yeah, yeah. Hang on. Yeah. It's starting to work. Yanny. <laughs> um, you guys, we, I, we need to fulfill some Patreon premium stuff Great. um so blair yes. i will be sending you uh info emails for you to get in touch with people oh great and then justin um what would be better i've uh reached out to people something that we need to do is make uh disclaimer voicemail messages for people uh, yeah but this has come up before and i've never done it but we have a few people to do it for now it hadn't it hadn't been something to do. And I didn't come to you and say, this needs to be. Yeah, you have, you have done that before. Um, <laughs> I never came up with anything clever is the problem. Well, it's different people have different things. It doesn't have to be too clever. Just a disclaimer. Yeah. You just say disclaimer, disclaimer, well, disclaimer. It doesn't have to be just it a disclaimer. Should. You can Every just... disclaimer is the pinnacle of cleverness. <sighs> just, it can be simple. It can be, it can be disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Blair's away taming hippos, but she'll call you when she gets back. Oh, that's great. You, you should know, write stuff it like and that. then I'll perform it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yes. So I need, your, I need funny. your voice, Justin, to record these. So Can, can uh, I tell you something? I apparently have a voice that gets recognized. Yes, you do. I didn't realize this because in my own head, I don't hear my voice. I have no idea what I sound like. Uh, it's somewhere between, in my head, it's it's somewhere between uh, Jeff Goldblum and, and uh, uh, Doofenshmirtz. Uh, <laughs> So, no, no, like, like I have no idea what I actually sound like. And, and it turns out some folks that are they're they're acquaintances, but they're but they're like closely knit acquaintances in a weird way. Who's Doofenshmirtz? Just realized who that I'm the Who's same Phineas person they Bird? listen to on oh, the radio, oh and God, because they finally put the it. voices together. That's it, finally. Just finally put the voices together and went, hey, you're the guy who does the radio. I'm like, yeah, I do that. But but it was, it's like, it's happened a few times where somebody has no idea who I am, but they voice recognize me. Like, you sound familiar. So so uh, based on on that, I will say that I now have an iconoclastic voice. Is that a thing? Iconoclastic? Iconoclastic? Plastic? I don't know what that word means. Maybe it's not that. Um, but yeah, I would love to do it. I just, I just, I can't for some reason, even my own foot, like this isn't, this isn't the, something I'm unwilling to apply to other people. I can't even do a proper voice message on my own phone. Like, I don't know how I'm like, I, you, I'm not, otherwise I would have picked up, but obviously I'm not because this is a message. And so then just text me because I hate looking at voicemails please do not leave the voicemail it might be too late if you're hearing this it's probably too late but it's still late. still stop what you're doing and text me and I, like i don't know what to say i i am the exact opposite i get really angry when people don't leave me voicemails but oh, i can't stand it i love voicemail what it is what's, so like, what's why the heck voicemail? did you call me what's a voicemail nowadays with texting and everything an email a voicemail is 
I called you. I, you could already have this information, but call me back or I'll try again later. No, See, don't I try like me it. Again later. I like it because if, if I get a text, I open it up and then I close my phone. If I don't have time to answer right away, I forget about it because there's no, you know, alert on my phone. But I don't check my voicemails till I can actually call people back. And then I call people back. And then you get their voicemail. And then you're like, I... You called me, now I'm calling you, and we're... And that's why yeah, don't we just text this out? Time. Because we, this is... A, the yeah, point. but a lot of the time, then you can just leave the answer via voicemail, and the oh. conversation is over. Also, things that um, you try to get across in text or in email often don't. Mm -hmm. If I go more than oh, two emails context. back and forth with a person, I just pick up the phone. I'm like, you know, I'm going to use my human voice to get to the bottom of this conversation because <laughs> this is infuriating. There, there's a great Keenan Peel uh, skit that they do about misreading the context of, of a text message in which one thinks they're going to, you know, meet up face to face, hang out, have a beer, chill out. Like he's, he, this is the conversation he thinks he's like, Oh yeah, I'll totally meet you anywhere. And the other one's like, Oh, you'll meet me anywhere. Oh, like getting all like <laughs> aggro about it. Like they're going to fight. And then one side's escalating and getting more aggro. And the other's like, oh, that's really sweet. Okay, cool. Yeah, let's meet that. <laughs> <laughs> because without a, that, those little subtle cues that we get mm -hmm. from even voice intonations, uh, sometimes <laughs> the words themselves can uh, be misleading. Language. It's important. It's important. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hot Rod. <laughs> uh, the secret's out. Text Blair a whole bunch of times, and she will call you soon. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's how that works. Sure. Um, okay. Moral being, Justin, you got to do some voicemail greetings. Yeah. Uh, Justin, okay. you got, I'm going to be mailing out. I'm going to be mailing out a bunch of stuff. Blair Blair's them, mailing out. No. Them. No, no, you need to do your job. I do yeah. my job. Blair's going to do her job. We're yeah. all going to do our jobby jobs. <laughs> and then it's all fine and happy and everybody's happy. We want to make people happy. Yeah. Yeah. So, but here's the problem with leaving somebody else's <laughs> voicemail. Again, Look, it's bad. Nobody that, wants yeah. me doing the disclaimer. So that's the thing. No, like I can do it, I but it's not going to be the I'll same. But, but somebody else, because right, I don't know what to say. It's like, hi, I know you're calling for Dr. Kiki, who obviously this isn't. But... <laughs> <laughs> but you no, have think it, think right about it. Number, so don't hang up just, just uh, write it like it's a jack feedback episode just write it as though you're saying you know where somebody is and why they're indisposed and throw some drama in there and then say leave a message yes yeah, i don't think in, i think you can do it you write I think entire call episode the police and think somebody has stolen their phone or is holding no. them captive yes yeah, you're not the only person to have ever done that one of the one of the people uh, on Patreon said that they really like the the warning at the end of the shows about messages with twists in the subject line being spam filtered into oblivion. Oh, uh, okay. So maybe you can kind of mix that together. Disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Unless you, you know, unless you leave your name and number and why you called, this is going to be spam filtered into oblivion kind of a thing. I don't know. That's that's good. But again, if I called somebody and the voice immediately wasn't that person, I'd be like, oops. And then I wouldn't leave a message. It just seems <laughs> like a bad idea. Well, so well, first they of can all, let it, they can let us know if it's a bad idea. They'll just be like, this didn't them. work out. This really didn't work out for me. Thanks for the MP3. Yeah. So first <laughs> of all, yeah, they don't have to keep it. Second of all, there's a, an NPR show broadcast nationwide called mm -hmm. Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, where mm -hmm. the thing that people win every week is a comedian or somebody from the show recording their voicemail greeting. This is a normal mm -hmm. thing that people have done for a very long time. Yeah, and it's, it's, and it's funny. Like, yeah, it's fine and it's funny. You're going to do it. You're going to do it. It's going to be. I just think this is an attempt for somebody to impersonate me. No. They, they nope. pretend that they're me online. People call. They get the voicemail. It sounds like me. That must be him. Oh, and then they meet them in the dark alley and are murdered. I don't but, want that to be. But Justin, why would they want 
to impersonate you? <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. Because they want to be Jeff Goldblum. Yeah. yeah. Actually, I feel that way too about like, they're like, you need to sign up for this thing to protect your credit. I'm like, what credit? <laughs> like, hey, is it a swap? Can I switch with the other person? Because I think I might come out slightly ahead. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. Anywho, um, with my pieces, I only have the coloring sheets from last year. So I'll be reaching out to each of these individuals and asking them if they want it in black and white or they want me to color it before I send it. Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see. That's good. Yep, but that's what you, yeah, mm -hmm. what you have left and what we can, what you can offer. Those are my people. arts. It's still original art and still. I will color it if they want it. Or they can so, color it if they want they it. they can color it. It can be a collaborative piece. It's up to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, but I, have to, I have to decide if I want to like mount it in some way before I send it because they're very floppy. Mm, I'll figure it out. <laughs> I have floppy art. Yeah. So, yeah, you like I might send it and then on the send it. Yeah. That would make it look nice. Or yeah. you can just send it on a piece of cardboard. Yeah. Yeah. The, the problem sure being, I usually have lots of cardboard. Yes, I do. I usually inscribe the back of the art to the person and sign it, but, um, I can't do that because it's thin paper. So that's why I may be matting it. Uh, and then can... we'll see. We'll see. Got it. We you're the see. artist. I'll figure it out. Yeah. You're the artist. Make it work out. Yeah. Um I guess that's it. Any big plans for the weekend? No, I have to work Saturday and Sunday. Prepping for summer. Woo! Oh yeah, getting ready for all of your student interns. Yes, 110 of them this year. It's a lot of teenagers. It's a lot of Older teenagers, high school age teenagers. That's a lot of trouble. It's a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I kind of thrive on it though. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, this is my my short window of opportunity to like mold the next generation. Have your influence. Yeah, exactly. See the ripples in the yeah. pond. And at first they're like, this this lady's really mean and strict, but then by the end, <laughs> I always get a lot of um, heartwarming conversations before people graduate. I just got a senior portrait from one of my teens that I've had oh, for three years, and his his inscription on the back said, "Dear Blair, thanks for putting up with me these past few years. I definitely think I grew the most when I was working for you." Aww. So, <laughs> that's awesome very sweet yeah. especially since it was a kid that i i i often spoke his name in a heightened tone let's say and, <laughs> and use sentences like now do you think that's a good idea <laughs> <laughs> that's the kind of uh teen mentor i am just <laughs> fyi <laughs> Now let's think this through. Do you really think that's smart? Or do you think maybe you should do that differently? I do think you should be considering that. Do you think you should balance that animal skull on top of your head? Or do you think maybe you should put it on the padded cart that is meant to be transporting skulls? Ah, uh, teenagers. You know, if uh, if that one breaks, we'll need another one to replace it quick. Yeah, yeah. Just saying. Yeah. Oh, yeah. New news out by science. Uh, puppies, dogs are their cutest they're ever going to be at eight weeks old, and that's it. Once they get past eight weeks old, it's all downhill. What's the so point just... of no return for humans? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's the point of re no return. It's pink, pink not pink, pink cuteness. Peak peak cuteness, peak. eight weeks. What do eight we think weeks, it is for kids? It's all you get, dogs. What do you think it is for babies? 
Eight months? Continual. No, not no, at all. No, it would That's be like annoying. it would be like two <laughs> years, probably. Two years? Oh, you ah. think toddlers are peak cuteness, but they're toddlers. They're yeah, like they're, they're like they're funny because they're like drunk adults. Yeah. Yeah. They're like can't quite walk right. They're slurring their words. They're talking in jumbled sentences. I think it's yeah. when they're still young enough that they they can't get into too much trouble, and they're going. Ah. <laughs> Just like that. Just like that. Right. So, so the interesting thing about this dog cuteness study, which, you know, doesn't have lots of samples and, it, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know how truly representative <laughs> is it, it is, but yeah. what they're getting at is trying to find out uh, because of the relationship between people and dogs that they're kind of looking at the evolutionary explanation for the cuteness of animals uh, peaking at about the time that their mothers are weaning them so that maybe humans might be more likely to pick up where the mother leaves off. Mm. So that is the the kind of working, hy working evolutionary hypothesis. Hmm. That makes sense. Meh. Ad hoc hypothesis. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's make this make sense. Let's make it make sense. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. It's 10 30. It's 10. It's 10 30. It's time for it's time for bed. Time 30. Bed. 10 for bed. <laughs> That's exactly it. The words aren't working as well as they did earlier. We used them all up. We sure did. <laughs> It's so funny. I keep I, I, Fada's not in the chat room anymore, but he he said like numerous times, I can't believe you talked about that slug memory story for nineteen minutes. Yeah, was it that long? <laughs> yeah, I guess wow. it was. I guess long. so. It was a long time. May require some editing later. I don't know. Maybe. But... <laughs> well. I'll just edit out all of my skepticism. No, you need some of that. <laughs> <laughs> we need that. That's exactly what we needed. I got so excited, Kiki. I got so excited by that story. And then yeah. I dashed your as hopes you well should, As Blair, as you well should have. It's I like I thing. like my grain of salt. That's very important to me. It is. It is. But it, it, you know what? It kind of reminded me of was the the Lady Viking story. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. where yeah, it's like we okay, all of a sudden also. because it's a lady, now we have to go. Well, where did it like the drill down on the stories? It tells more sometimes about why somebody's drilling down on it than the story itself. Mm. Mm. I think that's Kiki's agree to disagree face, <laughs> <laughs> and with that. Time 30, tis 10 for bed. Tis true, tis true. Tis time for us to Why go. Is everybody going to, what happened to, I thought we were going to do an after show. Oh, wait, this is the after show. We did one. Oh, all We right. talked about oh, cool. Yanny and Laurel. We talked about all sorts of fun so, stuff. Dogs. I have mm -hmm. to, before we go. Yeah. Uh, oh, I, no, I don't want to think about my mattress. <laughs> That's oh, right. Like a, Breathe uh, it in. It's like a microbial day spa. It's fine. Mm, it's exactly yeah. what you Yummy. want at the end. A regrouping with yourself. Okay, um, before we go, what do you want to know? Uh, do I, what's this? Do I have like a deadline or something on this recording okay. of this thing? Well, how, how about I get in touch with you with the, the names of people and any particular requests that they have? I'll send yes, you the notes. Those are helpful. Also, yeah. if I could know something of their hobbies. Uh, you know, actually, I feel like to do a proper one, I need to do more of a drill down. Get me their the passwords to their emails accounts, <laughs> uh, and I want to know like how they communicate and who they communicate with. And if, if this is Brad, don't bother leaving another message. You know, I need to know the yeah. all the info. Well, I mean, I do that kind of stuff uh, when I'm trying to decide which art to send them. So, I mean. Yeah, you could yeah, tell me what. Yeah, but yeah, give me up. give me what they gave you in terms of what they would like, and I will. Uh, and I'll, I'll send you there. I'll, I'll kind of forward emails to you, and then you can maybe communicate with them directly. Oh.
with and, other humans with other humans and take me out as a middleman uh, a middle woman yes but through email so you can pretend that they're robots or microbes so this is this is already like where i'm gonna go with like the voicemail like you know despite all of the advances of technology the human you're attempting to reach is not within range of their communication device. Have you considered, or would you consider, texting or emailing? It would be much simpler than <laughs> spending your time here in a voicemail box that probably won't be listened to any sooner than a message that you wrote or texted. And in or which case, in which case, they would already know what you wanted to talk to them about and could respond by the time this message ends. I could make it like one of the longest. Yeah, I like that. I like it. I also like the idea of playing with the idea of um, voice transcription since so many uh, that, that smartphones be... have that now that you'd be like, speak very clearly and enunciate because this person will never hear your voice. They'll just read the transcription. Oh. Or, or better yet, there was there's a there's a funny bit I saw in one of the one of the late shows where where somebody's doing an interview on the street where they've got a question for them, and it was about Mother's Day I think, and they they start like so so Mother's Day started and they go into the history of Mother's Day, but they go through like four pages of leading up to the question, but they never ask a question. <laughs> like, so, so it was sort of be like ear bait, right? Like they've gotten here. It's like disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. The person you are attempting to reach isn't currently here right now, but they have something very important that they would like to know before you leave the message. And this is dating back to the first time that they got a voicemail. They realized that the information contained within that voicemail had to do with a timely event, a history of their interactions together, some sort of future contact potential. But really what that was based on was the fact that throughout history, mankind is and just keep going without ever getting to the point. Yeah. Uh, You've, you're you're so already like, on it. You're so already create you're already creating voicemails. I yeah, know. So you're there. But they're not good yet. You'll get there though. I go I'm by the way, I go through five, six, maybe a cool dozen disclaimers. Disclaimers. Before the one you actually get to see. They yeah, especially are... like the one last, was it last week? <laughs> <laughs> no, that was, that was funny because, that was funny because I, I, the first thing I do is the disclaimer. I have to get it out of the way. Before I can get into the stories or working on stories, I, I, I got usually the stories like, uh, they've been read, they've been pinned, but I haven't like worked them. I haven't rewritten them and gotten them into like speaky voice. Right? Um, so when I sit down to really format the show, the disclaimer is the thing I do first. Somehow that week, there was a story that was interesting enough that I wanted to delve right into and, and went to that story to the next story, the next story. And oh, in my normal the, process, yeah. in my normal process, the disclaimer is already done before I've even started right. this, right. which is also why I always have to like, where the show's ready to start. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got to pee really bad and have for a long time. And I've been putting that out of my mind. Like everything else goes away and it's just getting the stories ready. And I got to the end of it and I realized oh, I didn't finish the thing I normally start with, which is the disclaimer, getting that fine. And so, yeah, I had like 30 seconds to explain to the audience, semi-apologetically, that uh, I, I hadn't written this. Threw it together. Yeah. Yeah, that was the week he wasn't there, right? Yeah, and that's why. Yeah. It's just threw everything off. Yeah. it was. That was it. I got to just be here. Yeah, it's your fault. That's right. It's my fault. It's my fault. I'll, I'll accept that responsibility. That's fine. That's fine. All right. Also, uh, uh, Blair cursed on the air. No, I didn't. Dead. Yeah, you did. No, I didn't. Oh, that was edited out, right? Before it went to radio. What are you talking about? You cursed on the. No. Go, okay, you got to go back and listen to it. I can't even remember what you said, but I remember very distinctly. Like I got to no. tell Kiki, and I totally forgot. 
Uh-uh. Is this one of those Yanni Laurel things where like you heard her I say it, but she didn't about, really? <laughs> I probably talked about, you know, I mean, this is the after show. I can probably say these things, right? No, I, no, no, you can't. I can spell a word. Can I spell no, a normal you can't spell. Word? Kids can spell. What are you going to do? Spell a word? The kids know how to spell. They know phonetics. That's how they teach you know, them to read now. I, talk, I so probably talked about phonetics. how an animal went from one place to another place and you misunderstood that word. <laughs> you they know. Shifted? I don't understand. No. 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 You know. It... Oh, yeah. That's probably what it was. <laughs> That was, and I and I did yeah. almost LOL during the show. Yeah, but I was using but a I, normal human word that is not. No, it's a smart word. And and I didn't react to it externally. That was inside, what it was, wasn't it? That's that must be what it was. Because remember there was something, but I remember inside I was like, <sighs> oh, this is something I would totally comment on if it wasn't in the course of the show live in the air, and I would just be like, ha, ah, that was funny. It was one of those funny things where language words intersect with multiple meanings and you can come to different conclusions. With Yes, come to different <laughs> conclusions. Yes, you can. That was it. Oh, my gosh. We sorted that a week or two I later. knew all about it because I you know. had a look on your face and I was like, no, I'm <laughs> using this word correctly and I shan't be... <laughs> Shan't. I shan't be shamed for it. I shan't. <laughs> don't, don't be shamed. Oh, don't we have some fun. All right. Uh, say goodnight, Blair. Goodnight, Blair. Say goodnight, Justin. Goodnight, Justin. <laughs> goodnight, Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for watching. We'll be back again next week. What button do I press?